Number 5. The Murder of Julia Wallace On January 19, 1931, 52-year-old insurance agent William Herbert Wallace went to the Liverpool Chess Club for one of his regular meetings. Shortly before William showed up, someone had called the club and left a message for him. The caller said that his name was R.M. Qualtro, and he wanted William to come to 25 Men Love Garden East the next night at 7.30 because Qualtro wanted to set up a policy for his daughter. William asked the other men at the club if they had ever heard of the caller or if they knew where Men Love Garden East was, but no one had ever heard of R.M. Qualtro or the street, but they assumed that it was off Men Love Avenue. The next night, William took several streetcars to get to his appointment, and the drivers on each streetcar remembered him because he pestered them to be dropped off at the right place and he kept asking for directions to Men Love Gardens East. After arriving at Men Love Avenue, William looked for the address and he asked for directions from several people before giving up and taking the streetcar back home. At 8.45 p.m., William was seen by his neighbors looking confused outside his house. Some neighbors asked him if there was a problem and he said he couldn't get into his house. He tried the back door again and he opened the door. Then, a few minutes later, William walked back out again and he said, Come and see. She has been killed. Inside the house, his 70-year-old wife, Julia Wallace, was dead. Her head was beaten in so badly that her brains were exposed. This prompted William to say, They finished her. Look at her brains. The police were called in and William was arrested for the murder. He was ultimately convicted of the murder and sentenced to hang. However, there were several problems with the case. First, the person who took the message at the chess club was certain that the voice of the caller didn't belong to William. Second, the crime scene was incredibly bloody. Blood was splattered everywhere when Julia was bashed 11 times with a slender, blunt instrument, yet William, who was a frail 52-year-old, didn't have a speck of blood on him. Finally, a delivery boy spoke to Julia Wallace after William had left. William's lawyers appealed the conviction, and the Court of Criminal Appeal decided to quash the conviction, citing a lack of evidence, and he was freed. Unfortunately, while William was innocent in the eyes of the law, many of his friends and colleagues thought he was guilty, and he was pretty much shunned. He ended up dying on February 26, 1933 from complications from a lifelong kidney problem, and he was buried next to his wife Julia. Number 4. The Disappearance of Brandon Lawson Late on the night of August 9, 2013, 26-year-old Brandon Lawson had gone in into an argument with his girlfriend, so he left their home in San Angelo, Texas, and he was heading to Fort Worth in his pickup truck. He was driving on Highway 277 when his pickup truck ran out of gas near Bronte, Texas. Once he had pulled over on the shoulder, he called his brother for help. A short time after that call, Lawson called 911, and this is the actual recording. 911 emergency. Yes, I'm in the middle of the field. It's like we're just pushing guys over right here going towards Javelin on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. I got to check the, the woods. Please hurry. Okay, now run that by me. And we're not talking to him. Hi, so you ran into him. Ah, you ran into him. Okay. Got the first guy. Do you need an ambulance? No, I need the cops. Okay. Is anybody hurt? Hello? Meanwhile, Lawson's brother, his brother's girlfriend, and the police all arrived at the same time at his truck, which was undamaged and out of gas. His brother called his cell phone and Lawson said that he was 10 minutes up the road. He also said that he was scared and hiding in some bushes. His last words were, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding, and then the phone went dead. Despite several searches of the area, Brandon Lawson has not been found, and his family is convinced that he met with foul play. Number 3. The Priest Murders Father Reynaldo Riviera was the pastor at St. Francis Catholic Church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. On the night of August 7, 1982, he was called to perform the last rites at a home in nearby Waldo, New Mexico. The mysterious caller said that he would meet the priest at a highway rest stop and then lead him to the house. When Riviera didn't return to the church, the police were notified. His body was found two days later in the desert, about three miles away from the highway rest stop. He had been shot to death. His car was found about five miles away from the murder scene. The police concluded that the murder wasn't sexual in nature and nothing was stolen, so the police were at a loss to a possible motive. Two years and a day after the murder of Riviera, another priest was murdered. Father John Kerrigan went missing just days after transferring to Sacred Heart Church in Ronan, Montana. His clothes were found on the side of the highway, covered in blood. About 10 miles away from the clothes, they found his car. It had been wiped clean of fingerprints, but the front seat was covered in blood. 
While no body has ever been found, the police believe that Kerrigan was murdered. One oddity that the police noted was that there was $100 among his clothes and over $1,000 in his car. A third priest was murdered 28 months later in Oklahoma City. 66-year-old Richard Dogan was found beaten to death in his apartment. His car was found abandoned several miles away from his apartment under a bridge. His tires were stolen, but the police believe that this happened after the car was abandoned by the killer. The fourth murdered priest was Father Francis Leslie Craven, who was brutally murdered in 1989. After spending a week in Florida with some friends, on January 7th, Craven flew back to his parish, which was just outside of Birmingham, Alabama, in a small city called Guntersville. He called a friend during a stopover in Atlanta and asked the friend to drop off his van at the airport in Birmingham. When Craven got to the airport, he found the van, which was full of electronics like a cell phone, CB radio, two cameras, and a stereo system. He called someone at the parish shortly after 10 a.m. and he said that he would be at the church for 11 a.m. mass. However, he would never make it to the church. Around the same time that Craven should have been preaching, his friend in Florida got a call from his cell phone. This didn't surprise the friend. They had a plan that Craven would call and hang up after one ring to let his friend know that he got home safe. Instead, the phone kept ringing, so the friend answered the phone. She said that the person on the line didn't sound like Craven. Also, he introduced himself as Father Craven, which was way too formal for their friendship. Another problem was that the caller kept mispronouncing the friend's name. Finally, the caller said, I got back to Birmingham without a hitch. And that was the last time anyone heard from Father Craven. Later the same day, Craven's body was found burning on the side of the highway, 60 miles southwest of Birmingham, in the opposite direction of his parish in Guntersville. He had been beaten severely, and it's unclear if he was alive or dead when he was set on fire. His van was found 15 miles north of the body. It too had been set on fire. Again, nothing had been stolen. Melted remnants of the electronics were found in the van. The police are unsure if any of the murders are connected because they were committed hundreds of miles apart in four different states. However, all the victims were Catholic priests who died brutal deaths, none of their possessions were stolen, and their cars were all driven away from the murder scene or from where the bodies were dumped and they were abandoned elsewhere. Finally, at the scene of the first two murders, bloody and deformed clothes hangers were found, and the police believe that they were used in the murders. The police haven't specified any possible motives, but in April 2015, the police announced that back when Father Kerrigan disappeared, he was suspected of sexually abusing children in different parishes around Montana. However, the other three priests are not suspected of abusing children, so the police are unsure if Kerrigan's crimes are connected with his murder or not. The only eyewitness in all four murders was a man who worked at a gas station about two miles away from where Craven body was found. He said that on the day of the murder, a white man with shaggy hair between the ages of 20 and 30 came to the gas station on foot. He bought a gallon of gas and walked off in the direction of where Craven's body was found on fire just an hour later. The man has never been identified and the murder of the four priests remains cold. Number 2. The Murder of Amy Mihaljevic After school on October 27, 1989, 10-year-old Amy Mihaljevic of Bay Village, Ohio, walked with her friend before breaking off at the Bay Village Square Shopping Center. Amy waited alone in the parking lot of the shopping center for a few minutes. Then another friend of Amy's, who was at the shopping center, saw a man come up behind her and whisper in her ear. At the time, her friend had assumed that the man was Amy's dad. A short time later, Amy's mother received a call from Amy, and she assumed that the little girl was at home. That all changed a short time later when Amy's brother called their mother and told her that Amy didn't come home after school. When the police interviewed Amy's brother and her friends, they made a disturbing discovery. A couple of weeks before Amy disappeared, a man had called her on the phone and asked if Amy was good at keeping secrets. She told the mysterious man that she could keep secrets, and she kept her word. She only told a few friends about the man, and her brother saw her talking on the phone, but she didn't tell any adults about the call. Not even the police officer who went to her class the very day that she went missing and talked about not going anywhere with strangers. The man on the phone told Amy that her mother had gotten a promotion at work and he would meet her at the shopping center so they could buy her a present. After meeting Amy in the parking lot, the man allowed Amy to call her mother to buy himself some time. Amy's family wouldn't find out what happened to her until four months later. Her body was found on February 8, 1990 in a farmer's field about 50 miles from her home. It's believed that she was sexually assaulted and stabbed to death shortly after she was kidnapped and then her body was dumped in the field that same day. The FBI was called in and they discovered that several young girls in cities near Bay Village were also contacted by a mysterious man. In each call, the man tried to lure the girls to meet him. He would tell the girls it was fine to meet because their parents had approved of it. Unfortunately, Amy's killer has never been caught. The man who kidnapped Amy from the mall was described as a white man between the ages of 20 and 30 with thick bushy hair above his eyebrows and he was 5'8 to 5'10 with a medium build. The latest in the case is that in June 2016, two more clues were released to the public. It was
was a homemade curtain that was wrapped around Amy's body and a blanket that was also found near the body. The blanket was white and generic, but the curtain, which is avocado green, was hand-stitched. Both the blanket and the curtain contained hairs belonging to Amy's dog. The FBI are hoping that someone will either recognize the curtain or the blanket and contact them. There have been several suspects in the case, but no one has ever been arrested in connection with the murder. Sadly, Amy's mother died without knowing the identity of her daughter's killer. She passed away in 2001 as a result of complications from alcoholism, which her friends and family said stemmed from Amy's death. Number 1. The Disappearance of Laureen Ron On April 26, 1980, 14-year-old Laureen Ron had two friends, a male and a female, visit her at her apartment that she shared with her mother Judith in Manchester, New Hampshire, while her mother was out of town for the evening. When the trio of kids heard voices in the hallway, the male friend thought it was Judith returning home, so he went out the back door of the apartment and Laureen locked the door behind him. However, the voice that they heard didn't belong to Judith. When Judith did come home at midnight, she found that the light bulbs in the hallway of all three floors of the building were unscrewed and the building was dark. Also, the front and back door of the apartment were unlocked. When Judith looked into Lorene's room, she saw someone in Lorene's bed and assumed it was her daughter, but it was actually her friend. Lorene was gone and she has never been found. At first, the police thought that Lorene had run away. However, when they couldn't explain why she didn't take anything with her, like her purse or her clothes, they realized that she probably planned to only leave the apartment for a short time and may have met with foul play. Then, six months later, Lorene's mother, Judith, found an oddity on her phone bill. There were three mysterious charges to her phone, which were made all the way across the country on a payphone at a motel in Santa Monica, California. Two of the calls were made to a motel in Santa Ana, which is about 50 miles away from Santa Monica. The third call was to a hotline for teenagers to ask questions about sex. The police checked the hotline, but the doctor who ran the hotline said he didn't know anything about Lorene Ron. However, five years later, the doctor was telling a different story when a private investigator employed by Judith interviewed him. The man, who identified himself as a plastic surgeon, said that sometimes runaways came to his house and his wife helped them out. He said that one of the girls was possibly from New Hampshire, but said he didn't know anything about her. The only information that he could give about the girl from New Hampshire was that a porn star named Annie Sprinkle might know something about her, because Sprinkle worked with his wife. Unfortunately, his lead didn't shed any light on Lorene's whereabouts. Something else that the private investigator uncovered in his investigation was that one of the motels where the calls took place had been used by a notorious and mysterious child pornographer named Dr. Z. However, the investigator wasn't able to determine if Dr. Z was connected to the hotline. Besides the three phone calls made in California, there were other strange calls involved with this case. About a year after Lorene went missing, Judith said that she started getting calls at 3.45 a.m. The calls would come around Christmas time every year until she moved to Florida and changed her number. Another call was made in 1986 to Roger Moray, who was a childhood friend of Lorene. His mother answered the phone and the caller said that she was a former girlfriend of Moray named Lorene or Lori. The woman never called back and it's unclear if the call is connected to the disappearance of Lorene Ron or not. Judith believes that her daughter is alive and she went to California to follow her dream to be an actress. She also thinks that her friends at the time knew more than they told the police. However, the police aren't convinced of that theory and think that Lorene met with foul play. It should also be noted that between 1980 and 1984, three other young girls and a woman went missing within a 50 mile radius of Lorene's home. The first to go missing was 26 year old Denise Denault. She lived on the same street as Lorene, just two blocks away, and she went missing six weeks before Lorene. Then, on March 22, 1980, nearly a month before Lorene disappeared, 15 year old Rachel Garden vanished while walking to a friend's house in nearby Newton, New Hampshire. This was followed by the kidnapping of 8 year old Tammy Belanger, who went missing on her way to school in Exeter, New Hampshire, on November 13, 1984. Finally, on July 13, 1984, 15-year-old Shirley Ann McBride disappeared as she walked to visit her boyfriend at his place of employment in Concord, New Hampshire. There is no physical evidence that links the cases, but all five cases do share some similarities besides being within a 50-mile radius of each other. Notably, all the victims were petite brunettes and none of them have ever been found. Number 5. Dale Williams Around noon on May 27, 1999, 42-year-old Dale Williams was at his business, Pro Body Shop, in Nucla, Colorado, playing a round of darts with a friend. During the game, someone called the shop and Williams answered the phone. His friend said by the way he talked, it sounded like he was talking to a woman. The call was to go help somebody who needed a jump start, and they were between the communities of Bedrock and Paradox, Colorado, which was about 35 miles away from the shop. 
Before leaving the shop, Williams checked into the office and told the staff that he was going out on the call. His staff thought that it was unusual that he was going out on the call because he wasn't a mechanic. Later that night, he didn't return home, but his wife just assumed that he got caught up at work and she went to bed. The next morning, she discovered that he hadn't returned home, so she called the police. The police searched for Williams, but he was nowhere to be found. Then, over the next several weeks, odd things started to happen. First, torn up photographs of Williams and his family were found on the ground outside of his auto body shop. Also, there were 22 caliber bullets scattered on the ground. A short time later, Williams' wife, who owned a video rental store, found a 22 caliber handgun in the video drop box. His wife recognized the gun because it belonged to Williams. The police think that someone broke into the shop and stole the gun and the photographs. This led the police to speculate that the killer might be a former friend of Williams. Williams and his wife helped the former friend's wife move out of state and they refused to give him her new address. The police interviewed the former friend and they dismissed him as a suspect. Five weeks after Williams disappeared, a family swimming at the confluence of the San Miguel and Dolores Rivers in western Colorado made an unusual discovery. Ten feet below the water was Williams' truck. The truck was in gear and the ignition was on, meaning that someone drove it into the water. The car was dumped about 40 miles away from the area where Williams was heading for the call. The police determined that the call was made from a stolen cell phone, but they don't know who made the call that lured him out of the shop. They also have no idea what happened to Williams. Sadly, his body has never been found. Dale Williams' family is still hoping that someone will come forward with information that will crack the case. Number 4. Solinda Jean Winnegar In early 1979, the Winnegar family of Burlington, Vermont started to get harassing phone calls. The callers seemed to have a real hatred for the family's youngest daughter, 17-year-old Celinda Jean, who went by the name Cindy. The calls got so bad that the family was forced to change their phone number. On March 21, 1979, Cindy left her home to go visit a friend, but she never made it there. When her parents realized that she was missing, they contacted the police. The police thought that Cindy had run away because in the months before she disappeared, Cindy had started smoking marijuana and she had become argumentative with her parents. Her family thought it was possible that she could have run away, but shortly after she disappeared, Cindy's mother got a horrifying call from an unidentified man. He said, you want your daughter? She's tied up at the bottom of the Wynuski River. And then the man quickly hung up the phone. The family told the police about the call, but they supposedly didn't follow up on it or look in the river. Over the course of the next few years, there were several unconfirmed sightings of Cindy. For example, two years after she disappeared, one of Cindy's aunts said that she saw Cindy standing at the back of her father's funeral, but no one else saw her. Years later, Cindy's mother passed away without ever finding out what happened to her daughter. Cindy's siblings think that it's possible that she ran away, but they also point out that she has never made contact with any of her friends or family in nearly 40 years. Also, in all that time, no trace of Cindy has ever been found. It is as if she walked through a crack in reality and disappeared. Number 3. Kelly Burt Dove On the night of June 18, 1982, Kelly Burt Dove was working the night shift alone at the Imperial Gas Station in Harrisburg, Virginia. She wasn't supposed to work that night, and she only had the shift because she traded with one of her sisters. Just after midnight, Dove called 911 and told them that she was getting strange and disturbing phone calls. She said that the calls really unsettled her and she asked for an officer to come by and watch the store, but unfortunately the police did not send anyone to the store. At 2.27 a.m., Dove called 911 again. She said that a man came into the store and he was dressed inappropriately. Again, Dove asked for an officer to come to the store. Minutes later, Dove called 911 a third time. This time she sounded really scared, and she said that the man was pulling up to the store again. Dove told the 911 operator that the man was driving a silver car, possibly a Ford. The police finally arrived two minutes after the third call to 911, and Dove was nowhere to be found. On the counter, a magazine was open, and a cigarette was still burning. There were no signs of a struggle, nothing was stolen from the store, and Dove's purse was also left behind. Unfortunately, the police pretty much botched the investigation from the start. They didn't collect fingerprints or even close down the gas station after Dove went missing. 
Since they did such a horrible job during the investigation, they were never able to find any evidence as to what happened to Dove and no arrests were made in the abduction, but there were two strong suspects in the case. The first suspect is a man that Dove went to high school with that had a history of making obscene phone calls and indecent exposure. The problem is that in the three phone calls to 911, Dove doesn't identify the man, which she probably would have done if she had recognized who was harassing her. Another theory is that she was killed by a man named Glenn Barker. Barker sometimes drove a Ford, and in the days after Dove disappeared, he was seen painting his car. Barker also had a history of violence against women and young girls. The first known incident happened in 1981 when he kidnapped a young woman at Knife Point in North Carolina. Barker tied her to a bed inside his house, but luckily she escaped when he went to move his car. Barker was arrested for kidnapping, but the victim refused to testify, and Barker was given a two-year suspended sentence. He then moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. On the night of July 12, 1982, just three weeks after Dove disappeared, 12-year-old Katie Worski was kidnapped during a sleepover at a friend's house in Charlottesville, which is about an hour's drive away from where Dove went missing. Barker was an early suspect in the case because he had been dating the mother of Katie's friend. He was interviewed by the police and he said that on the night that Katie disappeared, he went over to the apartment after everyone was asleep. He said that he gave Katie and her friend some beer and then he left the apartment when they fell asleep. The police didn't believe his story and they asked for permission to search his apartment. Barker gave them permission and they searched his apartment where they found wet clothes with blood on it. Some of the blood was type B which was Katie's blood type. They also found a pair of young girl's underwear hidden in his sock drawer. There was a spot of blood on the underwear in the same area where Catherine injected herself with insulin because she was a diabetic. Unfortunately, Katie's body has never been found. Even without a body, Barker was convicted of second degree murder, but he only served nine and a half years in prison. He was released in 1992 at the age of 33. After he was released, he got into a relationship with a woman named Cynthia Johnson who lived in Richmond, Virginia. On August 29, 1996, the fire department was called to Cynthia's home because it was on fire. Inside the home, the police found the bodies of Cynthia and her seven-year-old daughter, Heather. They both had been brutally murdered before the fire was set in seven different places around the house. Barker had an alibi for the time of the murders, but he was caught lying about the alibi. Also, a neighbor of Cynthia Johnson saw Barker's pickup truck near the house around the time of the fire. However, there was no physical evidence implicating Barker in the double murder, and he was never charged. Barker is also considered a suspect in the murder of 18-year-old Paula Jean Chandler in Charlottesville. Chandler went missing the day after Dove was kidnapped after going to a co-worker's apartment to watch a movie. Her body was found two days later in the Riviana Reservoir. She had suffered two serious blows to the head, but she was alive when she was dumped into the water. Chandler worked at a restaurant that was about a mile away from where Barker lived, and she also lived close to Katie. Barker denied being involved in any of the murders, including the one that he was convicted of. He died in 2014 at the age of 55 in a golfing resort town in North Carolina. Number 2. Amber Tuckerow On August 18, 2010, 20-year-old Amber Tuckerow traveled with a friend and her 14-month-old son from Fort McMurray, Alberta to Nisku, which is just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. The plan was to stay in a motel outside of the city to save some money and then go into Edmonton the following day. But Tuckerow was too excited, so she decided to hitchhike into Edmonton that night. When she hadn't returned by the next morning, her friend contacted her mother and her mother called the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, also known as the RCMP. The RCMP didn't take the disappearance seriously and they removed Tuckerow from the missing persons list after a month even though she hadn't been found. Two years after she went missing, there was still no trace of Amber Tuckerow. That is when the RCMP released part of a phone call that was made by Tuckerow to her brother who was incarcerated at the time and the prison recorded all phone calls. What you're about to hear now is Amber Tuckrow's last phone call. Where are we by? We're just heading south of uh, Beaumont, or north of Beaumont. We're heading north of Beaumont. Yo, where are we going? Just... No, this is a... Are you f***ing 
fucking kidding me? You better not take me. You better not take me anywhere I don't want to go. I want to go into the city. Okay. Yo, we're not going in the city, are we? Oh, we're going. No, we're not. Yeah. Then where the f*** are these roads going to? 50th Street. 50th Street. Are you sure? Absolutely. Yo, where are we going? 50th Street. 50th Street? 50th Street. East, right? East. It's the over town. Problem. Problem. Four days after the call was made public, horseback riders happened upon a human skull. Dental records showed that the skull belonged to Amber Tuckerow. In the call, the driver says that he is driving Tuckerow north towards Edmonton, but he actually drove her southeast to the rural area of Leduc County. The call where the clip was taken from was a 17 minute long phone call and Tuckerow's body was found about 17 minutes away from the motel. The RCMP, who admitted they mishandled the case, are hoping that someone will recognize the voice and reach out to them. If someone does recognize the voice and contacts the RCMP, it may help solve three other unsolved murders as well. Since 2003, the bodies of three other women, who were all Aboriginal women, have been found dumped in the same area as Tuckerow. 30-year-old Katie Ballantyne disappeared from Edmonton on April 28, 2003, and her remains were found months later in Ladue County. Next, on May 9, 2004, 27-year-old Corey Ottenbred was last seen by her family before she left to go work as a prostitute on the streets of Edmonton. Six days later, 33-year-old Dolores Brower went missing while hitchhiking in Edmonton. Both of their bodies were found on a rural property in Ladue County in July 2015. The bodies of all four women were dumped within five miles of each other. The RCMP are looking at the possibility that all four women were killed by one individual and he may have claimed more victims that have yet to be found. Number 1. Gregory VMA On the afternoon of October 16, 1984, four-year-old Gregory VMA was playing outside of his home in the small town of La Peña sur Valone, France. At around 5 p.m., his uncle received a disturbing phone call from an anonymous man. The caller said that he kidnapped Gregory and drowned him in the Valone River. After talking to the man, he called Gregory's parents and they contacted the gendarmes who were soldiers that worked as police in the area. Sadly, his body was found at 9 p.m. in the river, about four miles from his home. His hands and ankles were tied up and he had drowned. A day after the murder, Gregory's parents, Christine and Jean-Marie, received a disturbing letter. It reads, I hope you die of grief, boss. Your money can't give you back your son. Here is my revenge, you stupid bastard. The postmark on the letter indicated that it was sent the day of the murder from the post office in the town. When they were interviewed by the gendarme, Gregory's parents immediately blamed the murder on a mysterious man whom the family and the media called the Crow. The Crow started harassing the family in 1979 by phoning Jean-Marie's father, Albert. When Albert got his phone tapped to find out who was making the calls, the crow stopped phoning and instead he started mailing letters. In the letters, which were long and rambling, the crow advised Albert to disown Jean-Marie. Then, in 1981, the crow started terrorizing Jean-Marie, Christine, and Gregory. Between 1981 and Gregory's murder in 1984, they received over 700 phone calls from the crow. The crow had a hoarse voice and he would tell the family intimate details about themselves like he knew when they were home and where they would go out to eat. He threatened all the family members and he had a particular hatred for Gregory, whom he called the little boss. Christine and Jean-Marie told the authorities about the threatening phone calls and they were told to record them. They recorded his voice several times, but unfortunately he has never been identified. There were several suspects in the murder of Gregory and two people were even arrested. The first person to be arrested in connection with the murder was a man named Bernard LaRoche who was a cousin of Jean-Marie. LaRoche was supposedly around the river at the time of the murder and a handwriting expert said that his handwriting was similar to the writing in the letter. LaRoche was arrested on November 5, 1984, but he was released on February 4, 1985 and he was cleared of all charges. This upset Gregory's father, Jean-Marie, and when he was asked about it by the press, he vowed to kill his cousin. 
Sure enough, six weeks later, on March 29, 1985, Jean-Marie shot LaRoche dead with a rifle in front of LaRoche's wife and his four-year-old son. Jean-Marie ultimately was given five years in prison, with one year suspended. After LaRoche's murder, the government took the case away from the gendarme and gave it to the National Police. When the National Police took over the case, their prime suspect was Gregory's mother, Christine, and she was arrested in July 1985. In the family home, they found ropes that were similar to the ones that were used to bound Gregory, but they weren't a match. Also, witnesses say that they saw her in the post office on the day of the murder, meaning that she could have been the person who sent the letter. Handwriting experts also thought that the handwriting in the letters from the crow were similar to Christine's handwriting. But there were a few problems with the evidence. First off, the witnesses who said that they saw her at the post office contradicted each other. Secondly, Christine was home to get Gregory off the school bus, so she would not have had enough time to kill her son, dump his body, and make it to the post office. Due to all these holes in the case, all charges against her were dropped in February 1993. That was the last arrest in the case, and it has sat cold ever since. Starting in the 2000s, the police tried to pull DNA from the evidence, including the letter. Tests showed that there was male DNA in the letter, but under the stamp and under the envelope seal, there was a woman's DNA. Neither DNA matched the parents, and unfortunately, no match for the DNA has ever been found. Today, the murder of four-year-old Gregory VMA, or Lafayre Gregory, is considered one of France's most haunting unsolved murders. Number 5. Jamie Santos In 1991, 27-year-old Jamie Santos of Wheeling, Illinois, was working as an exotic dancer. She wanted to get into another field of work, but the appeal of being her own boss and the pay kept her working as a dancer. Santos lived in a house just down the road from her family, and they shared a close relationship. On the night of October 27th, Santos wasn't feeling well, so she didn't work that night. The next day, at 11.31 a.m., the following call came into 911. 911, five. Yeah. Uh, can you give me a to place to someone to 1765 Stonehead Court immediately? There's a young woman there who's not breathing. She's turning blue. All right, hold on just a minute, all right? Because this is Buffalo Grove. Just a minute. That's okay. Hold on just a minute, okay? I'm going to try and transfer you. Hold on a second. Five minutes later, paramedics arrived at the address and found the door to the house closed but not locked. Inside the house, they found Santos on the floor of the bedroom. She was fully dressed, but she wasn't breathing. She was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. Santos was pronounced dead a short time later. An autopsy showed that she had been suffocated to death with a pillow. There was some bruising on her face and her hands, but there were no other injuries on her body. Notably, she had not been sexually assaulted. The police traced the 911 call, and it came from a payphone outside of a liquor store, not far from Santos's house. One interesting thing to note is that the caller knew Santos's exact address. Specifically, he knew that she lived on Stone Hedge and not Stone Henge, like the prehistoric monument in Wilkshire, England. Cheryl Lavin, a reporter with the Chicago Tribune, points out that this is unusual. Out of all your friends and family, how many of their exact addresses do you know? You may know how to get to their home, but you may not know a lot of people's specific address. Yet, the 911 caller knew exactly where Santos lived. The police aren't sure if the caller was a witness to the murder or the killer himself. They said that they are leaning towards the caller being a witness because why would the killer call 911? 
A big question facing the police in the murder investigation was what was the motive? The police think that Santos knew her killer and she led him into the apartment. Based purely on speculation, they think that the killer may have come on to her and she rejected him, so he snapped. Another possible motive was robbery. Since Santos worked as an exotic dancer and was paid in cash, she kept some money in the house. The problem was that the police didn't know how much money was in the house before the murder, so it was tough to determine if anything was stolen. The police were able to pull fingerprints from the crime scene, but they have not found a match. There have been several suspects over the years, but they have all been cleared and the case is cold. The police and the Santos family are hoping that the person who made the 911 call will come forward and maybe he'll be able to shed some light on who killed Jamie Santos. Number 4. Connie Machaca In 1978, 17-year-old Connie Machaca was living with her father in Napa, California. On the evening of June 9th, Connie had plans to go to a party. In the late afternoon, a family friend drove her to a western clothing store where she was supposed to meet a friend. But where she went after that is a mystery to this day. She didn't make it to the party or return home. The police were called, but they didn't take the case too seriously because of Connie's recent behavior. Connie, like many teenagers, had a bit of a rebellious streak. At the time of her disappearance, she was dating a 25-year-old man and her parents didn't approve of the relationship. Their disapproval didn't stop her from seeing him though. She would sneak out of the house at night and walk to his house. Each time her family found the bed empty, they would call the police who would pick her up and bring her home. Connie also had a history of running away. In the first half in 1978, there were six recorded times that she ran away. So the police just assumed that Connie chose to disappear. Her parents were adamant that her disappearance wasn't self-imposed. They pointed out that Connie didn't take any of her personal belongings with her. They also said that on the day that Connie disappeared, she wasn't angry like the other time she ran away. In fact, she was in a good mood and she was excited to go to the party that night. The police didn't take the parents' plea seriously and the case didn't get any media attention. Then, in the weeks that followed, Connie's mother received several disturbing phone calls. Sometimes it was a man on the phone, while other times it was a woman. In each call, they claimed to know what happened to Connie. On some calls, they would say she had been kidnapped, while on other calls, they would say that she had been murdered. The calls got to be so bad that Connie's mother had a nervous breakdown. The callers were never identified, and it's unclear if they were responsible for Connie's disappearance or if it was just a sick prank. However, it's important to point out that Connie's disappearance didn't garner any media attention. Connie's father said that his next door neighbor didn't even know about the disappearance. Yet, the man and the woman called Connie's mother to harass her about her daughter's disappearance. If they weren't involved with Connie's disappearance, then how did they know she was missing? In 2001, Connie's mother submitted a DNA sample to a federal database for missing children, hoping that it would give them some answers to Connie's whereabouts. Unfortunately, it didn't provide them with any answers. The police do not believe that after all this time that Connie is still alive, but they do not know the location of the remains or who is responsible for her death, and the case is currently cold. Number 3. Henry McCabe On September 6, 2015, Henry McCabe of Mounds View, Minnesota was hanging out with some friends, which included a man named William Kennedy. That night, they went to a club in Spring Lake Park, and they left before it closed. Kennedy said that Henry wanted to be dropped off at the Super America gas station near the town of Fridley, which was in the opposite direction of Mounds View. Kennedy said that he dropped off Henry at the gas station at 2 a.m. At 2.23 a.m., Henry's wife of 11 years, Corrine McCabe, received a call from his cell phone. She was in California at the time, and she answered the call. She said that she heard Henry screaming, and he said that he had been shot. During the call, Corrine dialed in Henry's brother, 
and the call went to his voicemail. The full voicemail cannot be found online, but it is about two minutes long and it contains very little talking. Instead, it is mostly weird sounds. The following is just some of the sounds that can be heard on the voicemail. At the end of the voicemail, there are a few moments of silence before someone, quite possibly Henry, says stop it, and then the voicemail abruptly ends. When Henry didn't show up for work, the police were notified. The police interviewed William Kennedy and some other friends that Henry was with that night. For reasons that weren't made clear, one friend was in possession of Henry's wallet and Kennedy had his keys. Kennedy said that he dropped off Henry at the Super America gas station, but when they checked the gas station surveillance footage, they saw no trace of Kennedy or Henry. Instead, they found video of Kennedy dropping him off at a different gas station, a holiday gas station, which is about three miles south of the Super America gas station and about four and a half miles away from Moundsview. They also checked the area where Henry's phone last pinged off a tower and it was in the New Brighton area, which is about two miles away from the gas station where he was dropped off. For two months, the police, Henry's family, and volunteers searched for him. Then, on November 2nd, 2015, his body was found in Rush Lake in New Brighton. In that last phone call, before Crean dialed in Henry's brother and got his voicemail, she said that Henry stated that he had been shot, but there were no gunshot wounds on Henry's body. Instead, the medical examiner determined that Henry drowned, but he is unsure if it was an accident or a homicide. Rush Lake is just over four miles from the gas station where he was dropped off. If Henry was heading home from the gas station to Moundsview, he probably would not have gone past Rush Lake. So why was Henry near Rush Lake, and how did he get there? If he walked all the way to Rush Lake, it would have taken him over an hour. But his wife got the distressing phone call at 2.23, which is about 23 minutes after he was dropped off at the gas station. That would suggest that someone drove him there, but who? Unfortunately, this question, like many other questions in this case, has yet to be answered. Henry's family thinks that the phone call and the fact that his body was found so far from where he was last seen indicates that he met with foul play. They are hoping that someone will come forward and shed some light on what happened in the last hour of Henry McCabe's life. Number 2. Tracy and Patient On the night of January 30th, 1976, 13-year-old Tracy Ann Payson, who lived in Henderson, which is a suburb of Auckland, New Zealand, went to visit a friend. Tracy Ann and her friend spent most of the night gossiping about boys, and Tracy Ann showed her friend the signet ring that her boyfriend had given her. Around 9 p.m., Tracy Ann called her mother and told her that she would be home in half an hour. Tracy Ann and her friend started walking to Tracy Ann's house which was about a mile away. Her friend said goodbye at the intersection where the local police station was located and she walked back home. When Tracy Ann didn't make it home by 10 o'clock, her family started to search for her. The next morning, the police were searching the neighborhood for Tracy Ann. Her body was found 12 hours after she went missing, less than seven miles away from her house. Her body had been dumped at the edge of a regional park. She had been strangled to death with her pantyhose. Someone had wrapped the pantyhose around her neck and then tightened it with a stick. One item that was missing was the signet ring that her boyfriend had given her. The murder shocked the people of Henderson and the citizens were hoping that the killer would be arrested quickly. The problem was that the police didn't have much in the way of evidence. There was a man seen in the area where Tracy Ann was kidnapped, and shortly before Tracy Ann was kidnapped, he was seen bothering three girls. They were also looking for the driver of a cream or white 1967 Ford Cortina. Hoping to generate any type of lead, they set up a telephone hotline. Tips poured into the hotline, and nearly all of them were useless. Then, in November 1978, 22 months after the murder, the hotline got a call from a mysterious man. 
He said that in a garbage can beside a pharmacy in Avondale, which is another suburb of Auckland, they would find Tracy Ann's signet ring. He also said that the numbers 126-040 are somehow connected to Tracy Ann's murder. Finally, he said that he would call again. The police went to the pharmacy, and in the garbage can they found a signet ring. They checked with the boy who gave Tracy Ann the ring, and he said it was the same ring. Unfortunately, the man didn't stay true to his word, and he never called again. Over the past 40 years, there have been over 850 suspects, and tips still sporadically come into the police, including theories as to what the numbers 126-040 mean, but not much progress has been made on the case in the past four decades, and the case is currently cold. Number 1. Katrina McVeigh Life wasn't easy for 27-year-old Katrina McVeigh of Woonsocket, Rhode Island. In 1992, she had three small children, but she didn't have custody of any of them, and they lived with her parents. She also had just escaped an abusive relationship with her husband, Richard McVeigh. In May 1992, Katrina was on drugs, and she was working as a prostitute. On May 3rd, Katrina was seen getting into a car, and then she vanished. Due to her lifestyle, her family didn't realize that she was missing until six weeks later, and then they filed a police report. The obvious suspect in Katrina's disappearance was her estranged husband, Richard McVeigh. He supposedly called Katrina's mother and told her that she was buried beside the Blackstone River. This prompted Katrina's brother to search the banks of the river, and he thought that he found the shirt that she was wearing when she went missing, but he couldn't be certain. After several searches of the riverbanks, neither he nor the police found any other evidence of Katrina. Then, a short time later, Katrina's mother was in a Bible study group, and also in attendance was Richard McVeigh. During the meeting, someone called Katrina's mother and left a message for her. The caller bluntly said, you will never find her. Sadly, the mysterious caller has been proven right so far because Katrina's body has never been found. Richard McVeigh was interviewed by the police and he denied killing Katrina and says that he didn't call her mother. He said that Katrina's mother hated him and she blamed him for all her daughter's problems. Without any physical evidence, Richard McVeigh was never charged in the disappearance of his wife. However, Richard McVeigh wasn't the only person of interest in the case. Between late 1989 or early 1990 and June 2001, there are five other unsolved murders of women who lived in Woonsocket, which is a city with a population of about 43,000 people. The first victim, who has never been identified, was pulled from the Blackstone River on January 31, 1990. The body had been in the water for at least four weeks. Her body was so badly decomposed that it was hard to distinguish many of her features. The medical examiner thought that she was African American and she was probably 17 or 18 years old. The most likely cause of death was a blow to the head that fractured her skull. Then, between November 1990 and March 1991, two sex workers, 18-year-old Christine Miller and 23-year-old Wendy Madden, were strangled to death. Jump ahead three years to March 17, 1994 and 28-year-old Megan Paul was found stabbed to death in her apartment in Woonsocket. Finally, 31-year-old Cindy Roberts, who also was a drug addict and worked as a prostitute, was reported missing on July 4, 2001 from Woonsocket. Her skeletal remains were found 16 months later in a wooded area near Lincoln, Rhode Island, which is about 10 miles away from Woonsocket. All five of the murders, like that of Katrina McVeigh, are unsolved today and it's unknown if any of them are connected. Then, between 2003 and 2004, there was another string of murders in Woonsocket. Three sex workers were all strangled to death, and then they were dismembered. Just like Katrina McVeigh, two of the victims' remains were never found. The difference between these three murders and the other six is that this time, the killer was caught and he confessed. His name is Jeffrey Mailhot. Mailhot was convicted of the three murders in 2006, and he was sentenced to two life terms in prison. 
When the original series of murders began in December 1989 or January 1990, Mailhot would have been 19 years old. Mailhot has been questioned in the murders of the other six women, but he has never been charged. The murders of the six women in Woonsocket are currently cold, and unless someone comes forward, it is likely to stay that way. Number 3. Justin Bergwinkel In 1990, when Justin Berwinkle was 18 years old, he joined the United States Army. Berwinkle's goal was to become a ranger. For three years, he was stationed at Fort Ord in Monterey County, California. While stationed there, he started to date Yolanda Antunes, who was a student at Santa Clara University. Things were going well, but then in early 1993, Bergwinkel started to act strange. Antune said that he was moody, and he would abruptly end dates, and he would make secretive trips back to Fort Ord. Then, in the spring of 1993, Berwinkle was transferred to Fort Lewis, near Tacoma, Washington. After two months there, Berwinkle was given a two-week leave. He drove to Santa Clara, and he spent two weeks with Antunes. She said that during this time, his behavior became even more erratic. He carried around a briefcase, and he was secretive about what was inside of it. One day, Antoon secretly watched Burwinkle when he opened the briefcase. She said that there were papers inside of it, and Burwinkle was shredding them. Then, shortly afterwards, Antunes came home and found Burwinkle sobbing. When Antunes asked him what was wrong, he refused to talk about it. Not long after that episode, Antunes received a strange phone call. It was a man, and he told Antunes to tell Berwinkle that the mission was off. Antunes asked the caller what he meant, and he just reiterated that she was to tell Berwinkle that the mission was off, and then he hung up the phone. When Antunes passed along the message, Berwinkle became very upset. He started cursing, and he stormed out of the apartment. At the end of his two-week leave, Berwinkle drove back to Fort Lewis, but he didn't stay long. He bought two handguns and 100 rounds of ammunition, and then he went AWOL. When he went AWOL, Berwinkle hid out in Antoon's apartment. After a few days, he called Fort Lewis, and he said that he would return to the base. He didn't, though. Instead, he again started making secretive trips to Fort Ord. Antunes pleaded with Berwinkle to tell her what was going on. The only insight Berwinkle gave was alluding to the 1992 movie, White Sands. In the movie, a small town sheriff finds a dead body and half a million dollars in the desert. The sheriff decides to impersonate the dead man and gets swept up in an international illegal arms deal. Shortly after the conversation, on June 12, 1993, Berwinkle left Antunes' apartment and disappeared. Three months later, his car was found in the parking lot of a beachfront motel not far from Fort Ord. The guns he purchased weren't in the car, and they were never found. In the trunk of his car was his briefcase. In the briefcase was his keys and his wallet. In his wallet was his army dog tags. Before he went missing, Burwinkle told Antunes that if someone ever found his dog tags, and he wasn't around, that meant he was probably dead. The police think it is quite possible that Burwinkle is dead. He may have had a mental breakdown and took his own life. Another possibility is that he was murdered. He could have been involved in some type of illegal weapon sale, and he was killed when something went wrong, or he was double-crossed, or he was killed by a greedy partner. Another possibility is that Burwinkle chose to disappear. He may have chosen to leave because something went wrong with the supposed arms deal, or he may have needed to disappear for another reason. Until Justin Berwinkle is found, dead or alive, his friends and family may never know what happened to him. Number 2. Georgia Cruz On the evening of April 8, 1980, 12-year-old Georgia Cruz's parents left her at home with her older brother. Around 5.30 p.m., Georgia walked barefoot out of her family's home in the small town of Montford, Florida, which had a population of 397 people. 
where she was going is unknown. It's believed that she was either going to a market or her best friend's house, both of which were nearby. Wherever she was going, she didn't make it. Her family and many townspeople searched for her, but she was nowhere to be found. Two days after she went missing, the sheriff's office got a call regarding Georgia. The caller said, Hello? Yeah? You know that girl that you are looking for? Yeah. The 12 year old? Yeah. She's dead. Similar calls were placed to Georgia's grandmother and the wife of the town's police marshal. Five days later, the caller was proved right. Georgia was found dead in a sparsely wooded spot in a park about 25 miles away from where she went missing. The cause of death was a single stab wound to the back. One possible odd clue was found on Georgia's body. Georgia usually wore a necklace that consisted of a delicate chain and a gold pendant. She was found wearing a necklace that had a cross made from two pieces of silver colored metal that were welded together. There were also small holes drilled into the metal. The cross was attached to a thick silver chain. The necklace looked homemade. Her family doesn't remember her wearing it before the murder and they have no idea where she got it from. The case has since gone cold and has created a sense of uneasiness for the small town. One reason it unsettled the town so much is because there is speculation that the killer was local. On the night that Georgia went missing, no one remembers seeing any strange or unfamiliar cars in the area. Georgia may have also been more likely to get into the vehicle of someone she knew. The police think that the caller could have been the killer and they think that the caller was local. He knew who the police marshal was and he was able to call his house where his wife answered the phone. He also called Georgia's grandmother as opposed to calling her parents. This indicates he knew intimate details about the town and or Georgia. Unfortunately, none of the calls were ever traced. The call to the sheriff's office was recorded, but sadly, the recording has been lost over the years. Without the recording, the police are hoping that someone will recognize the cross and contact them. The police are hopeful that Georgia Cruz's murder will be solved. However, at the time of this video, the case is cold. Number 1. The Long Island Serial Killer In April 1996, a couple was walking their dog on the beach in Davis Park on Fire Island, New York, when they made a horrifying discovery. It was a pair of women's legs wrapped in plastic. The legs were collected by the police and they tried to find out who they belonged to, but they weren't able to. Nearly a year later, the torso of an African American woman was found inside a Rubbermaid container near Hempstead Lake State Park in Lakeview, New York. She wasn't identified, but she got the nickname Peaches because of a tattoo of peaches on her left breast. Three and a half years later, in December 2000, another woman's torso was found. This one was found on a beach in Manorville, New York. Jump ahead another three years to 2003. On July 26, a second torso was found in Manorville. This time, the police were able to identify the remains. The torso belonged to 20-year-old Jessica Taylor. Taylor was last seen a few days earlier at the Port Authority bus terminal in Manhattan. Then, between July 2007 and September 2010, five women, who worked as sex workers, disappeared from New York City and Long Island. At the time, no one pieced together that the body parts and the missing women were connected. In December 2010, police with the K-9 unit were searching for 24-year-old Shannon Gilbert. Gilbert was one of the five women. She was reported missing in May 2010 and she was last seen in Oak Beach in Long Island. The police were searching Gilgo Beach, which is seven miles from Oak Beach along Ocean Parkway and they came across the body of a woman in a burlap sack. The body was identified as 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew, who went missing July 10, 2009. 
The discovery sadly confirmed what Melissa's family already knew in their hearts. Melissa had been murdered. They thought she was dead because of a series of phone calls that happened after she disappeared. Melissa's sister, Amanda Bethelemy, received five phone calls, one every week for five weeks. The calls were made using Melissa's cell phone. The caller would insult and mock Amanda over her sister's disappearance. In the last phone call, the man told Amanda that Melissa was dead and then he hung up the phone. The police tried to trace the calls, but they had a problem pinpointing the exact location for two reasons. The first is that the caller kept the calls under three minutes. The second problem is that when they were able to trace them, the calls were made from very busy areas of New York City, like outside Madison Square Gardens and Times Square. The police think he did this because if they were able to trace his location, he would blend in among the people. After the fifth call, the call stopped. Two days after Melissa's body was found, three more bodies were found not far from hers. Like Melissa, they were wrapped in burlap sacks and they had been strangled to death. They were later identified as Megan Waterman, Maureen Brainyard Barnes, and Amber Lynn Costello. Them, along with Melissa, were four of the five women who went missing between July 2007 and September 2010. The fifth woman, who had not been found, was Shannon Gilbert, who the police were searching for when they found Melissa's remains. About a month after the discovery of the four bodies, the district attorney announced that they were looking for a serial killer. Unfortunately, no solid leads turned up, but more body parts were found. About three quarters of a mile away from the four bodies, along Ocean Parkway, a skull, hands, and a forearm were found. They were determined to be from Jessica Taylor, who was the second torso found in Manorville. Five days later, three more sets of remains were found along Ocean Parkway. The first set of remains were body parts that belonged to the first torso that was found in Manorville. Sadly, the remains have never been identified. The other two sets of remains have not been identified either. One was an Asian man who was dressed in drag. He died from blunt force trauma. The second was a female toddler. Most likely, she was between the ages of 16 and 24 months. Eight days later, even more remains were found near Jones Beach State Park, which is also on Ocean Parkway. The first set of remains were bones that belonged to the Jane Doe known as Peaches, who was found in 1997. DNA testing was done, and it was determined that Peaches was the mother of the toddler that was found eight days earlier. Neither mother nor daughter have ever been identified. The second set of remains included a skull. DNA testing concluded that the skull and the set of legs that were found on Fire Island in 1996 came from the same woman. Unfortunately, she has never been identified. Nearly eight months later, the remains of Shannon Gilbert were found about a half a mile away from where she was last seen. The medical examiner could not determine if she was murdered, or if she died in an accident, or if she died from natural causes, so the district attorney doesn't think that she was a victim of the Long Island serial killer. Even before Gilbert was found, the police and the district attorney were unsure if one killer was responsible for the other ten murders, or if that area was just a popular dumping ground for killers. Other people think that he is responsible for all 11 murders, and quite possibly more. Shortly after Gilbert was found, the police announced that they were looking into the unsolved murders of sex workers in New York City and Long Island. They concluded that the Long Island serial killer may be responsible for another five murders. Unfortunately, no one has ever been charged in any of the 16 deaths. However, in September 2017, the district attorney's office announced that they had a suspect in at least one of the deaths, and that is a carpenter and father of two named John Bitroff. Bitroff lived in Manorville, which is where the two torsos were found in 2000 and 2003. 
In the summer of 2014, Bayroff was arrested for murdering two sex workers in 1993 and 1994. He got away with the murders for two decades, and then the police had a stroke of luck. In 2014, Bayroff's brother Timothy was forced to give the police his DNA for a misdemeanor conviction for violating an order of protection. They entered his DNA into their system and they were surprised that they got a partial match to DNA that was left on the two murdered sex workers. So they knew the killer was a relative of Timothy's. They got a sample of Bitroff's DNA and it was a match. Bitroff was found guilty and in September 2017 he was given the maximum sentence for the two murders, 50 years to life. The police and the district attorney are going to see if Bitroff is connected to at least some of the Long Island serial murders. However, at the time of this video, the true identity of the Long Island serial killer is unknown. Number 2. Dana Chisholm Dana Chisholm was born in August 1969 in Rock Hill, South Carolina. She was a decent student and in high school, she was a cheerleader. Like a lot of teenagers, Dana experimented with drugs and at one point, she ran away from home. She eventually strained out her life and she went to college to study business. After college, in 1993, Dana moved to Washington, D.C. and just over a year later, she got a job as a secretary at a think tank. Dana's real dream was to be a singer. Her friends and family said that she sang like Whitney Houston. Just after 1 a.m. on February 27, 1995, Dana's parents, who lived in Rock Hill, received a strange phone call. The caller said that he was Lieutenant Lewis Douglas from the Metropolitan Police Department and he said that Dana had been arrested for prostitution. The caller said that Dana was really upset and she didn't want him to call her parents. The caller gave her parents a phone number where he could be reached and then he ended the call. Dana's father thought that the caller didn't speak like a police officer. He sounded edgy, he spoke fast and very loudly. Dana's parents tried to get a hold of her later that day but they were unable to. They decided to call back Lieutenant Lewis Douglas. When he answered the phone, Dana's father was shocked because Douglas had a different voice than the man who originally called them. Dana's father asked about his daughter and Lieutenant Douglas said that he didn't call them. Of course, this only made Dana's father more confused and Douglas didn't understand what was going on either. Douglas wasn't sure how the caller knew his office phone number. What was odd was that Douglas knew who Dana Chisholm was because he had been at her apartment weeks earlier. He was there because someone had stolen her television. So Dana's father asked Douglas to go check on her. Douglas drove over to Dana's basement apartment which was in one of the safest neighborhoods in DC. Her neighbor was the former director of the FBI. Douglas knocked on her door and he heard no movement inside. He left his business card at her front door. Dana's parents continued to try and get in contact with her, but they couldn't. At around 6 p.m., a friend of Dana's called her landlord because she didn't come into work that day. Her landlord ended up calling the police. Dana's body was found in her apartment. She had been strangled to death with a cord. The medical examiner estimated that the time of death was about 9 p.m. the day before she was found. Her apartment showed no signs of a break-in or forced entry. Not far from the apartment, a reporter found a key to the apartment. The police aren't sure if it was a key that Dana had given someone or if it was a spare key that Dana had hidden somewhere outside of her apartment. The apartment had been ransacked. It's believed that while the killer was ransacking the apartment, he found Lieutenant Douglas's business card. Then about four hours after he killed Dana, 
he called her parents, posing as Douglas. On the back door of the apartment, the police found a note that read, I'll be back, and then there were the initials, MPD. The lead detective on the case, Michael Farish, thought that the initials meant Metropolitan Police Department. The note was not left there by Lieutenant Douglas when he came to check on Dana. This note was found at the back door, and Douglas left his business card at the front door. Farish began to investigate Dana's private life. Since moving to DC, she had dated several men, and she was working as an escort. She would go on dates with the men, and then tell them that she needed money to pay her bills and her rent. It also turned out that Dana was four weeks pregnant. She had told a friend at work about the pregnancy, and when her parents had talked to her last, which was about a week before she was killed, Dana said that she planned on coming home to tell them some big news. Not long after the murder, a man with a raspy voice called the Homicide Division looking for Farish. He said that he wanted to talk about Dana Chisholm's murder. The first few times he called, Farish wasn't at his desk. The man left messages for Farish, telling him that he should phone him back, or the caller would never leave a callback number. A few weeks after the murder, Farish was at his desk when the man called. The caller said that he knew why Dana was killed. He said it was because of her lifestyle. He said that she went out to clubs, she drank, and she had sex with many men. The caller was adamant that Farish should share those details with the reporters who were covering the story. Farish ended up doing the opposite. He told the reporters that Dana was a naive young woman. Farish was hoping that by going against the caller's demands, they would force him to call again and possibly expose his identity. Not long after Farish's comments were published, Farish got another call from the man with the raspy voice. He was angry that Farish didn't tell the reporters the truth. Over the next two months, the man with the raspy voice called him twice more. Both conversations were short and testy. On the last call, the man told Farish that they should meet. He told Farish to meet him at a place just east of the river. Farish went to the area and waited for several hours, but the man with the raspy voice never showed up. Farish hopes that one day the man with the raspy voice will call him again. Or even better, he'll turn himself in. At the time of this video, the murder of Dana Chisholm is considered cold. Number 1. Susan Eads At the end of August 1983, 19-year-old Susan Eads was working two waitressing jobs at bars near NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. When she could get the gig, she worked as a DJ. On August 30th, 1983, Susan was working at a bar called Jason's Club in Webster, Texas. At the end of her shift, she left the bar alone. The next morning, her body was found hidden behind a bush in an empty lot that was a couple miles from the bar. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death with the jumpsuit that she was wearing. Her car was found close by in the parking lot of a business that sold boats. Her purse, her high school class ring, and her gold necklace were missing. The police interviewed people who were at the bar the last time that Eads was seen alive. They said that a man asked her to dance, and she turned him down. No one at the bar knew who the man was, but they gave a description that resulted in this sketch. One big problem is that the police have no idea if the man was involved in the murder because Susan left the bar alone that night. Shortly after the murder, Susan's mother, Shirley, who lived in Seabrook, Texas, started to receive strange phone calls. At first, the caller would just hang up after she answered. Then the caller started talking to Shirley. He identified himself as Bill 
and he said he lived on Telephone Road in Houston, which is an actual road in Houston. Shirley got in touch with the police, and they recorded some of the phone calls. These clips, which were made public in 2018, are from the actual phone calls. Hello? Hello? You said you knew Sue. Well, I still can't believe that I never knew of you. I don't understand you. Some people have secrets, you know, they like to keep themselves. You have some pictures of her, you told me. I'd like to see them. Just you, I ain't gonna show them to anyone else. Would you want me to meet you somewhere? My place or a hotel or something like that. Where can I say you? Houston? Here's some phone calls. Unfortunately, the caller never stayed on the line long enough for the police to trace where the calls were coming from. The police are hoping that someone will recognize the voice. If the voice is identified, it could also help solve several other murders. Susan's body was found about 10 miles away from one of the most infamous dumping grounds for bodies, the Texas Killing Fields. The field is named the Calder Oil Field and it's 25 acres of land inside the city limits of League City, Texas, which is south of Houston and north of Galveston. The field is close to Interstate 45, which is marked with a red line on this map. Since 1971, dozens of women and girls who live near the field in Interstate 45 have been murdered or have gone missing. The police think that at least four serial killers were active in the area between 1971 to the early 2000s. It's possible that Susan was a victim of one of these serial killers, or her murder may have just been a one-off. The first known victim associated with the Texas killing fields is 13-year-old Colette Wilson. On June 17, 1971, her band instructor dropped her off on a street corner in Manville, Texas. When her mother pulled up to the corner six minutes later to pick her up, she was gone. Fifteen days later, 14-year-old Brenda Jones disappeared from Gavelston. Her body was found floating in the water the next day near Pelican Island, which is part of the city of Gavelston. The cause of death was manual strangulation. A month later, on August 4, 1971, two 14-year-old girls, Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw, vanished after spending the afternoon at a beach in Gavelston. Two months later, on August 28, 19-year-old Gloria Gonzalez disappeared from Houston. On November 3rd, about a week after Gloria Gonzalez disappeared, 16-year-old Adele Crabtree left the hippie commune where she was living in Houston to hitchhike to work. Hours later, another young woman went missing. 21-year-old Linda Faye Sutherland was last seen leaving a bar on Telephone Road at 12.30 a.m. on November 4th. Telephone Road is the same road that Bill, the mysterious caller, told Susan Eads' mother he lived on. Hours after Sutherland was last seen alive, the body of Adele Crabtree was found near Conroe, Texas. She was fully clothed, and she had been shot twice with a shotgun. On November 7th, the body of Linda Faye Sutherland was found in a ditch a few miles from where she was last seen. She had been strangled, but that wasn't the cause of death. She had been shot with a shotgun, and she had 72 bullet wounds in her back, shoulders, and legs. Two weeks after that, the mother of 12-year-old Allison Craven who lived in Houston, reported her missing. Her mother had left her home alone while she ran out to do some errands. When she came home, Allison wasn't there, and the contents of Allison's purse were strewn about the home. Six days later, on November 15, 1971, two 15-year-old girls, Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson, went missing while hitchhiking in Gavelston. Two days later, their partially nude bodies were found floating in Turner's Bayou, about 10 miles away from where they were last seen. Both had been shot in the head twice. On November 26, 1971, less than a week after Debbie and Maria's bodies were found, the body of 19-year-old Gloria Gonzalez was found. 
Gonzalez vanished six days before Debbie and Maria went missing. Her body was found near the Addicts Reservoir, which is in West Houston. During the autopsy, the medical examiner discovered that a tooth that was recovered from the dump site didn't belong to Gonzalez. He thought the tooth must have come from another body that was dumped nearby, so he suggested a larger search of the area. Three days after Gonzalez's body was found, the remains of the first victim, Paulette Wilson, were found not far from Gonzalez's remains. Her head was missing. It was found four days later, not far from the rest of her remains. It had probably been moved by animals. The medical examiner concluded that Colette probably died from blunt force trauma to the head, while Gonzalez had probably been strangled to death. By the time 1971 came to an end, ten young women had disappeared between Houston and Gavelston. Only seven other bodies had been found. Just three days into 1972, the bodies of Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw, who went missing five months earlier, were found. Sharon's skull was found in Clear Lake, which is just north of League City and south of Houston. The rest of her remains, and the remains of Rhonda, were found in a nearby marshland. They had been bound and shot to death. Around the same time that their remains were found, some of 12-year-old Allison Craven's remains were found in a field not far from her home. A month later, the rest of her remains were found dumped in a field of Hareland, about 10 miles away from where she went missing. The string of murders of teenage girls shocked the people of Greater Houston and Galveston County, and understandably, people were afraid. Their panic started to subside in the spring of 1972, when several arrests were made. It started in April when 25-year-old Henry Lanham was charged with murdering Linda Sutherland, the seventh young woman, to go missing. Lanham had a criminal record that included conviction for sexual assault. On the night that Sutherland went missing, Lanham was seen talking to her at the bar. The police originally tried to interview Lanham months earlier about the murder, but he refused to cooperate. So the police kept him under constant surveillance, and the stress apparently got to be too much for him. In April 1972, after months of constant surveillance, he supposedly confessed, but he said that he wasn't the person who physically shot Sutherland. He said he was just present at the murder. He said that 22-year-old Anthony Michael Nopa was the person who shot Sutherland. Nopa was arrested, and in June 1972, he supposedly confessed to shooting Sutherland. Around the same time that Nopa confessed, Lanham also apparently confessed to the murders of Colette Wilson, Gloria Gonzalez, and Adele Crabtree. Both men went to trial in October 1972 for the murder of Linda Faye Sutherland. They both testified that they were coerced into making the confessions, and they swore that they were innocent. Nopa said that an officer threatened to shoot him if he didn't confess, and then the officer said he was going to cover up the shooting by making it look like Nopa was trying to escape. Both Lanham and Nopa were found guilty. Nopa was given a sentence of 50 years in prison, and Lanham was sentenced to 25 years in prison. As 1972 was coming to an end, Lanham was being held in the Harris County Jail awaiting his trial for the murders of Colette Wilson and Gloria Gonzalez. But he would never face those charges. On December 30th, 1972, Lanham was shot to death during an apparent escape attempt. In May 1972, a month after Nopa and Lanham were arrested, there was an arrest in the murder of 12-year-old Allison Craven. 22-year-old Henry Doyle Shufflin, a Vietnam vet with a history of mental illness apparently confessed to the murder. In October 1973, he pleaded guilty to first degree murder and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Two years later, Shufflin filed an appeal. He said he was innocent and that the confession and the guilty plea were both coerced. 
He said he only agreed to plead guilty because the judge on the case implied that he would get early parole if he pleaded guilty. Shufflin said that the judge even showed him a letter that he had written recommending that Shufflin should get early parole if he pleaded guilty. Shufflin's appeal was ultimately denied. Finally, in June 1972, about a month after Shufflin was arrested, the police in Webster, Texas, made an arrest. 24-year-old Michael Lloyd Self was charged with the murder of 14-year-old Sharon Shaw, but not with the murder of 14-year-old Rhonda Johnson, who was murdered at the same time as Sharon. They were the third and fourth girls to go missing. It was done this way because if the district attorney failed to convict Self of Sharon's murder, then they could have had him charged with Rhonda's murder. Self, who worked as a gas station attendant, as first running with the law in 1970 when he was arrested for a peeping Tom incident. He wasn't given jail time over the incident. Instead, he was ordered to receive psychiatric treatment. South then found himself on the radar of Michael Morris, who had recently become chief of police in Webster. Morris first encountered South when he was investigating the theft of some gas from the fire chief's station wagon. In June 1972, Morris brought Self into the police station to interview him about the murders of Sharon Shaw and Rhonda Johnson. After a few hours, Self supposedly confessed to the murders and he signed the confession. However, just like Lanham Nopa and Shufflin, Self swore that the confession was coerced and that he was innocent. He claimed that Morris threatened to beat him with a nightstick. When that threat didn't work, Self said that Morris took out his revolver, removed all the bullets but one, and then spun the cylinder. Self said that Morris held the gun to his head and told him to confess. When he didn't, Morris pulled the trigger. Luckily, there was no bullet in that chamber, but the game of Russian roulette convinced Self to confess. At Self's trial, his lawyer pointed out that his confession was full of inaccuracies. For example, he said he dumped the bodies 20 miles away from where they were found. He also said that he beat the girls on the head with a coke bottle, but the medical examiner determined that they didn't suffer any head injuries. Finally, Self confessed that he took their clothes with him, but their clothes were found with their remains. Self was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. Two years after Self was convicted, there was another arrest. The person who was arrested was Michael Morris, the former chief of police in Webster, who was responsible for putting Self in prison. Morris and the former assistant police chief in Webster were arrested by a posse of citizens in Cato Mills, Texas, after they robbed a bank. It turned out that Morris, along with a former assistant police chief and a third man had been involved in a string of bank robberies around Texas that started in 1972. Morris was convicted of the bank robberies and he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. The problem was that even with the three men in prison and one dead, the killings didn't stop. On October 20th, 1972, which was the same day that Lanham and Nopa were convicted, 15-year-old Mildred Joanne Knighton vanished from Pasadena, Texas. Her body was found in an industrial area of Pasadena three days later. She had been stabbed 61 times in the back, 9 times in the face, and her throat had been slashed nearly to the point of decapitation. On January 3, 1973, 16-year-old Kimberly Pitchford attended a driver's ed class at a high school in Houston. The class ended at 6 p.m. and she was supposed to call home for a ride. She never called and she never came home. Her body was found two days later under a bridge in a canal about 25 miles away from where she was last seen. The cause of death was ligature strangulation. On September 6, 1974, about 20 months after Kimberly Pitchford was killed, 14-year-old Georgia Greer and 12-year-old Brooks Bracewell vanished as they walked to school in Dickinson, Texas. 
The police told the girl's parents that the girls had probably just run away and they would most likely return at any time. Thirteen months later, the girls still had not returned home and another teenage girl disappeared. On October 22, 1975, 16-year-old Nina Lynn Klug watched Game 7 of the World Series at a friend's home in Rocheron, Texas, and then she left on her own to drive to her home in Cypress, Texas. Sadly, she never made it there. Her car, which had a dead battery, was found on the shoulder of Highway 6 near Arcola. Her nude body was found in a ditch lying on a pile of clothes close to Rocheron on Thanksgiving Day, which was about a month after she went missing. A year and a half after 14-year-old Georgia Greer and 12-year-old Brooks Bracewell vanished, their skulls were found near Alvin, Texas, not too far from where Colette Wilson, the first victim, was last seen alive. Both of their skulls showed signs of blunt force trauma. The rest of their remains were not with their skulls. Nearly a year after the skulls of the two girls were found, on May 21, 1977, 12-year-old Suzanne Bowers walked out of her grandparents' home in Gavelston. She planned to walk the mile to her home, get her bike, and then meet her friends at the beach. She never made it to the beach, and when she didn't return home that evening, her parents reported her missing. Her body was found nearly two years to the day that she went missing, in Santa Fe, Texas, which is about 20 miles away from where she was last seen. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. A month before Suzanne's body was found, 12-year-old Angela Desiree Kelly, who lived in Pasadena, was found murdered not far from her home. Her hands had been tied behind her back, and she had been strangled to death. The summer of 1979 nearly ended without another murder, but then a 12-year-old went missing from Conroe, Texas. On September 7, 1979, Alicia Michelle Jackson was swimming with her brothers at a public pool, and then she left the pool to walk home without them. Her body was found six days later in an oil field, about 17 miles away from where she was last seen. She had been sexually assaulted, and strangled to death. As the 1970s ended, the murder seemed to come to an end as well. Then on July 1st, 1982, 22-year-old Tamara Ellen McCurry disappeared from Gavelston. She was last seen getting into a strange van. Her body has never been found. Fourteen months later, Susan Eads was murdered. She was the 20th young woman or girl to go missing or to be murdered in the area since 1971. Another 14 months went by without another murder or disappearance. Then on December 10, 1983, 23-year-old Heidi Villarreal Fife disappeared after visiting a convenience store in League City. 16 days later, 14-year-old Sandra Ramber's mother made an odd discovery when she arrived home. The front door of their house in Santa Fe was open and biscuits were baking in the oven, but there was no sign of Sandra. Sadly, Sandra's body has never been found. In April 1984, the remains of Heidi Villarreal Fife were found in the oil field on Calder Road, which is known as the Texas Killing Fields. Months later, on July 29, 1984, 29-year-old Ellen Ray Beeson went missing after spending the evening at a nightclub in Lake City. In September 1984, a couple of months after Ellen Ray Beeson went missing, 16-year-old Laura Miller disappeared. She was last seen at the same convenience store in Lake City where Heidi Villarreal Fife was last seen 11 months earlier. Then in July 1985, there was a strange twist in the disappearance of 29-year-old Ellen Ray Beeson, who went missing a year earlier after visiting a nightclub in Lake City. A woman named Candy Gifford, who was a friend of Beeson's and was with her at the bar on the last night that she was seen alive, went to the police with an unusual story. Gifford said that when she left the bar, 
She noticed that Beeson was talking to Clyde Edward Hedrick. Over the next several months, any time that Gifford saw Hendrick, she asked him what happened to Beeson. Hedrick kept brushing off Gifford, then he finally decided to show her what happened to her friend. He took her to the Galveston Causeway, and under an abandoned couch was Beeson's body. Hedrick said that after the bar that night, he and Beeson went skinny dipping, and she drowned. He didn't think that anyone would believe that her death was an accident, so he hid her body under the couch. Hedrick told Gifford not to tell anyone about the body, or he would kill her and her family. Gifford didn't say anything to anyone for a few months, but then in July 1985, she told the police. Hedrick was arrested, and he told the police that Beeson had drowned. They couldn't find any evidence to the contrary, so he was charged and then convicted of abuse of a corpse. He served a year in prison for the conviction. On October 5, 1985, 17-year-old Michelle Doherty Thomas left her home in Santa Fe with two male friends. She didn't return home that evening, and two days later, her family filed a missing persons report. The police interviewed Michelle's friends that she was last seen with. The friends said that they were going out to a bar, but they stopped at a convenience store first. At the convenience store, Michelle supposedly got into a different man's car, and that was the last time they saw her. They later changed their story and said that when they were stopped at an intersection, a man forced Michelle to get out of their car and into his, and that was the last time they saw her. The police tracked down the man who supposedly kidnapped Michelle, and he was charged with her murder. However, those charges were eventually dropped. Michelle's body has never been found, and it's unknown if her disappearance is connected to the rash of murders, or if her disappearance is just a one-off. On February 2, 1986, the remains of a woman were found in the oil field on Calder Road. The remains have never been identified, and she is simply called Jane Doe. It's believed that she was about 25 years old. She was 5 foot 5 and weighed about 140 pounds. She had shoulder length reddish brown hair. She had been shot in the back and she had been in the field anywhere from 6 weeks to 6 months before she was found. Her body was found about 200 feet from where Heidi Villarreal Feist remains were found nearly 2 years earlier. The day after Jane Doe was found, about 50 feet from her body, the police found the body of Laura Miller, who went missing a year and a half earlier. Due to the condition of her body, a cause of death couldn't be determined. After the discovery of the 16-year-old's body, the area between Houston and Galveston was quiet yet again. By the autumn of 1988, it had been three years since the young woman went missing. On October 7, 1988, 22-year-old Suzanne Renee Richardson was working an overnight shift as a desk clerk at a condominium resort community in Galveston. She was last seen at 6 a.m. in the condominium's office by a security guard. Shortly after 6 a.m., an employee sleeping above the office heard a scream, then the sound of a car door slamming, and then a car speeding off. When a guest arrived at the office at 6.30 a.m., the office was empty and there was no sign of where Richardson went. What happened to her is still a mystery. Her body has never been found. On September 8, 1991, three years after Richardson went missing, another body was found in the oil field on Calder Road. She has yet to be identified, so she is called Janet Doe. She was about 31 years old, had long brown hair, and a small frame. She had suffered a spinal injury long before she was killed, and it may have caused her to have mobility problems. She had been dead at least six weeks before she was found. The police suspected that Janet Doe, who was the fourth body found in the killing fields, was not the work of the same killer who was responsible for the first three killings. They think this because it had been five years since the last bodies were found. 
Also, Janet's body was found in a different spot in the killing fields than where the other three bodies were found. The area experienced another quiet period, and people were hoping after two decades of murders that the killings had finally come to an end. That hope was shattered on May 13, 1994, when 16-year-old Trellis Sykes went missing while walking to school in Houston. Her body was found that afternoon about two miles away from her school. She had been strangled and beaten. On February 1, 1996, 14-year-old Lynette Bibbs and 15-year-old Tamara Fisher went missing after spending the evening at a teen club in Houston. Three days later, 40 miles away from where they were last seen, the bodies of both girls were found. They were found in a wooded area off Interstate 59 near Cleveland, Texas. Tamara had been shot in the forehead and below the left ear, and Lynette had been shot in the back of the head. Three months later, on March 5, 1996, 13-year-old Crystal Baker was found under a bridge in Chambers County, Texas. She was last seen alive two hours earlier, 50 miles away, when she stormed out of her grandmother's home in Texas City after a family argument. She had been strangled to death. Thirteen months later, on April 3, 1997, 12-year-old Laura K. Smither left her family's home in Friendswood, Texas to go for a jog. When she didn't return home, her parents called the police. Her body was found two weeks later in a retention pond in Pasadena, about 14 miles away from her home. She was wearing nothing but her socks. She had been strangled, and there were signs of trauma to the head. A month after Laura disappeared, on May 17, 1997, 19-year-old Sandra Sapa stopped at a convenience store on NASA Road 1, just seven miles away from where Susan Eads was killed 14 years earlier. A man pulled her into his truck and drove off. As he drove away, Sapa, who was pregnant at the time, jumped out of the speeding truck. She luckily wasn't too injured, and another motorist picked her up. Luckily, the fetus was not injured in her escape. On the night of June 7, 1997, a month after Sandra Sapa escaped from being kidnapped, 14-year-old Erica Ann Garcia went missing after visiting a teen nightclub in Houston. Her body was found the next day in a vacant lot about a mile from where she was last seen alive. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Two months later, on August 17, 1997, 17-year-old Jessica Kane, who lived on Tiki Island, which is part of Gavelson County, attended a cast party for a play that she was in. A month later, she was supposed to start university to study criminology. Sadly, she never made it home after the party. She was last seen leaving the restaurant where the party was being held in Dickinson, Texas. Years went by and no trace of Jessica Kane was found. The killings had also come to a stop yet again. And in the summer of 2002, the area was rocked by yet another murder. On the evening of July 12, 2002, 23-year-old Sarah Trusty left her home in Algoa, Texas to go for a bike ride. Later that evening, she was seen at a church near her home. She didn't return home that night, and she was reported missing. The bike that she was riding that night was found in the foyer of the church where she was last seen, but she was nowhere to be found. On July 28th, just a little over two weeks after she set out on her bike ride, her body was found on the Texas City Dyke, which is a levee in Texas City. The medical examiner was unable to determine how the 23-year-old woman died. On March 3, 2003, 16-year-old Maria Solis went missing after getting off a city bus close to her school in Houston. Nearly a year and a half later, her body was found by tree-cutting crews near Sugarland. The cause of death has never been made public. After Maria's murder, the murders of young women and girls in the area finally seemed to have come to an end. 
Starting with Colette Wilson in June 1971, at least 37 females were killed or went missing from the area between Houston and Galveston. The question then is, who is responsible for all these murders? As mentioned earlier in the video, it's suspected that at least four serial killers were active in the area throughout the three decades. In the years since the murders started, several men have been connected to some of the murders, and there have even been a few convictions. One of the strongest suspects for many of the murders is a man named Edward Harold Bell. In the 1970s, Bell was arrested several times for exposing himself to young girls. On August 24, 1978, Bell was cruising around in his pickup truck in Pasadena, Texas. He came across a group of young boys who were playing outside. He parked his truck and stepped out. He was naked from the waist down. As he walked towards the boys, he fondled himself. A woman named Dorothy Lane was inside her home looking out the window when she saw Bell get out of his truck. She called the police and her son, 26 year old Larry Dickens, heard her as she talked on the phone. Dickens, who was a former Marine, decided to do something about the situation. He went outside and took Bell's keys out of the ignition. Bell saw what Dickens did and he demanded his keys back, but Dickens refused to give them back. Bell grabbed a pair of jeans from his pickup truck and put them on. He then picked up a handgun and he pointed it at Dickens. He told Dickens to give him his keys back or he'd shoot. Bell then fired a shot in the air. Dickens told Bell that he wasn't going to shoot anyone and he should just calm down. He then took two or three steps towards Bell. When he did, Bell shot him five times. After being shot, Dickens took her to his garage and his mother came out to help him. She told Bell he should leave because the police were coming. Bell said he wasn't going anywhere until he got his keys back. Dorothy Ling took the keys from her son's hand and threw them at Bell. Bell went back to his truck and Ling was hoping he would just drive away. Unfortunately, he didn't. Instead, he grabbed a rifle and walked back into the garage. While Ling begged him to leave her son alone, he fired several more shots into the 28-year-old father of two. Bell then got into his truck and drove away. Larry Dickens died in his mother's arms. The police arrived a few moments after Bell had fled. So they sped off in the direction that Bell had just driven. He led them on a high speed chase and then when he was cornered on a cul-de-sac, he fired his rifle at the police officers. He tried to fire again, but his rifle jammed. After the rifle jammed, the police were able to arrest him without anyone else getting hurt. Amazingly, despite the incredibly violent and unprovoked nature of his crime, Bell was granted bail and he was released two months after he was arrested to await his trial. When it came time for his trial, Bell had vanished. Five years later, Bell still had not been found and the television program Unsolved Mysteries did a segment on him. The segment, which featured Matthew McConaughey in his first television role, aired in December 1992. Two months later, thanks to tips from viewers of the show, Bell was arrested in Panama City, Panama. He was extradited back to Texas and he was sentenced to 70 years in prison for murdering Larry Dickens. In 1998, while serving his sentence, Bell wrote a letter to the district attorney saying that he killed seven girls in Galveston in the early 1970s. However, the letter was kept secret for 13 years. During those 13 years, Bell's confession wasn't investigated. In the letter, he named three victims and described the other four. In the letter, Bell claims that he killed Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson who were both 15 years old and they were the 9th 
and 10th victims. They went missing in November 1971 from Gabelston. He wrote that another one of his victims was a teenage girl with reddish blonde hair named Pitchford. It's believed that he was referring to 16 year old Kimberly Pitchford who was killed on January 3, 1973 after attending a driver's ed class at a high school in Houston. The other girls he described were believed to be 13 year old Colette Wilson who went missing from Alvin, Texas in June 1971, 19 year old Gloria Gonzalez who went missing from West Houston in October 1971 and her remains were found near Colette's remains, and finally he said he killed two girls from Webster. It's believed that he is referring to Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw who went missing in August 1971. They were the third and fourth girls to disappear. What is troubling about Bell's confession is that someone was already sitting in prison for the murder of Sharon Shaw. In May 1973, Michael Lloyd Self was convicted of the crime and he was given a life sentence. Self died in prison in 2000, two years after the district attorney received the confession letter from Bell. Self went to the grave maintaining his innocence. And in the autumn of 2017, the Houston Chronicle interviewed Bell in prison and he said he didn't just kill the seven girls. Instead, he said that there were 11 who went to heaven. He didn't name the other four victims, but he described them. It's believed that they were 14-year-old Georgia Greer and 12-year-old Brooks Bracewell who were together when they went missing in 1974. He said he picked up another victim on the side of the highway and it's believed that he was talking about 16-year-old Nina Lynn Klug. She was murdered in 1975. The description of Bell's supposed 11th victim didn't match any known murders or disappearances. He said she had reddish blonde hair and he killed her in the mid-1970s. Records show that Bell was living in the area when the girls were killed and in some cases he had personal connections to the places where they were last seen. Also, several of the girls were last seen getting into a van and Bell owned a van at the time. Despite his confession, Bell has never been charged with any of these murders because there is no physical evidence proving he committed the murders. Some people don't think that Bell committed the murders and he is just taking credit for them. Another suspect in some of the murders is Clyde Edwin Hedrick. Hedrick was arrested in July 1985 after the body of 29 year old Ellen Ray Beeson was found stepped under a couch that was abandoned near the Gavelston Causeway. In 2013 the police decided to re-examine Beeson's death and they had her body exhumed. Another autopsy was performed and it was determined that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. 28 years after Beeson died, Hedrick was arrested and he was charged with involuntary manslaughter. In 2014, he was found guilty and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. After his arrest, the police started looking into his past and they interviewed his former girlfriends. Several of his ex-girlfriends implicated him in the murders of 23-year-old Heidi Villarreal Fife and 16-year-old Laura Miller. Both young women went missing from the same convenience store. Villarreal Fife went missing in October 1983 and Laura went missing in September 1984. Both of their bodies were found in the field on Calder Road. It's also believed that Hedrick is responsible for the murder of the Jane Doe who was found in the field in February 1986. Hedrick claims that he didn't kill the three young women who were found in the field and no evidence ties him to the murders. As for the second Jane Doe who was found in the field in 1991 and is called Janet Doe, a man has confessed to that murder. Mark Rolling Stalling said that he picked up the woman who was strung out on drugs on NASA Road 1 and he killed her. When Stallings admitted to the murder, he was incarcerated. He is serving a life term for kidnapping and assault with a deadly weapon. The charges stem from an attempted prison escape. 
He tried to escape while serving two 50-year sentences for burglary and for shooting a man through an open window. The man he shot was wounded, but he didn't die. Stallings has never been charged with the murder of Janet Doe. He is also the prime suspect in the murders of two other women who are not connected to the Texas Killing Field murders. Another suspect is a man named Robert Abel, who is Mark Rowling Stallings' boss when he supposedly killed Janet Doe. Abel was a former NASA engineer, and he owned the property next to the oil field on Calder Road, where the bodies of the four young women were found. The FBI developed a profile of who may have killed the four women, and Abel matched the profile perfectly. However, there was no evidence or eyewitnesses that connected him to the murders. Also, he had no criminal record. The FBI profile was enough proof that Abel was the killer for Tim Miller, who is the father of Laura Miller, whose body was found in the field in 1986. Tim Miller claims that he even went to Abel's home and held a gun to his head. However, Abel denied that ever happened. Tim Miller now thinks that Clyde Hedrick is the person who killed his daughter. Robert Abel has never been officially cleared as a suspect. He swore he was innocent, and he said that the accusations ruined his life. In July 2005, Abel was killed when the golf cart that he was driving was struck by a train. A fifth suspect in some of the murders is serial killer Anthony Allen Shore. In October 2003, Shore was brought in for questioning after cold case investigators linked DNA found under the fingernails of 21-year-old Maria del Carmen Estrada, who was sexually assaulted and strangled to death in April 1992 in Houston. Shore confessed to that murder, and he also confessed to three other ones. He said he committed his first murder in 1986 over five years before he killed Maria del Carmen Estrada. He said he kidnapped 15-year-old Laura Lee Tremblay from Houston as she was walking to school. She was the only one of his victims who wasn't sexually assaulted, but like the rest of his victims, he strangled her to death. Then two years after he killed Maria del Carmen Estrada, he claimed his third victim. He kidnapped nine-year-old Diana Reballer in August 1994 in Houston as she was walking the block from her home to a convenience store. Finally, he admitted to killing 16-year-old Diana Sanchez in July 1995. He got her into his van after offering her a ride home and then strangled her to death with a yellow cord. Shore was convicted of the four murders and he was sentenced to death. In the lead-up to his execution, Shore confessed to a murder associated with the Texas killing fields. Texas Rangers interviewed him on death row, and they determined that he didn't know the right details about the crime. The Rangers also questioned him about the murder of Susan Eads, and after the interview, he was cleared as a suspect. Shore was executed on January 17, 2018. A sixth suspect is a man named Kevin Edison Smith. Smith worked for oil companies as a welder. In September 2010, he was arrested for the 1996 murder of Crystal Baker, the 32nd victim. Crystal was last seen alive by her family when she stormed out of her grandmother's home in Texas City and she was found two hours later under a bridge. In October 2009, a cold case investigator had DNA under her fingernails and on her clothes tested. It was male DNA, but it didn't match anyone in the database. Then 11 months later, Smith was arrested on an unrelated charge in Louisiana. A DNA sample was taken, and when it was put into the database, it was matched to the DNA found under Crystal's fingernails and on her clothes. He is suspected of committing other murders, and not just in Texas, but in Louisiana, Arizona, and North Carolina. However, he has only been charged with killing Crystal Baker. He was convicted of that murder in April 2012, and he was sentenced to life. A final suspect is a man named William Lewis Reese. 
Reese was released from prison in Oklahoma in 1996 after he served 10 years for two sexual assaults. When he got out of prison, he got a job in construction, and even though he lived in Oklahoma, he often worked on construction sites in Texas. After the murder of 12-year-old Laura K. Smither in April 1997, he was considered the prime suspect, but he was never charged due to a lack of evidence. In May 1997, he kidnapped Sandra Sapa, who escaped by jumping out of his truck as it was moving. Reese was arrested five months later for attempting to kidnap Sandra Sapa. He was convicted and he was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Unfortunately, in those five months between the attempted kidnapping and his arrest, Reese committed several more murders. First, he killed 20-year-old Kelly Cox. On July 15, 1997, Cox disappeared after touring the Denton County Jail with her criminology class. She called her boyfriend and said that she locked her keys in her car. When he arrived at the jail with a spare key to the car, Cox was nowhere to be found. On July 26, Reese kidnapped 19-year-old Tiffany Johnson from a car wash in Bethany, Oklahoma. She was later found strangled to death. DNA evidence linked Reese to Johnson's murder in 2015. In March 2016, Reese directed the police to a field that is 30 miles south of Houston in West Orem. Buried in the field, they found the remains of Kelly Cox. In the same field, they also found the remains of 17-year-old Jessica Kane, who disappeared on August 17, 1997, after she attended a cast party for a play that she was in. Reese has been charged with the murders of Laura K. Smither, Kelly Cox, Tiffany Johnson, and Jessica Kane, but he has yet to go to trial for any of those charges. Out of those seven suspects, it is thought that they are responsible for 20 of the 37 murders. It's possible that the seven men are responsible for more murders, just not near the killing fields, but in other states as well. Also, there are the four men who claim they were innocent, but they were nevertheless convicted of three of the murders in 1972. One of those murders was the murder of Sharon Shaw, which Michael Lloyd Self was convicted of, and Edward Bell took credit for her murder in his letter in 1998. If the other three men really did commit the other two murders, that still leaves 15 unsolved murders. This includes the murder of Susan Eads. The police are hoping that someone will recognize the voice of the mysterious caller so that the friends and family of Susan Eads will at least know who is responsible for stealing her from their lives. Also, identifying him could bring closure to many other families who lost daughters, sisters, and mothers around the Texas killing fields. Hello? Hello? You said you knew Sue. Well, I still can't believe that I never knew of you. I don't understand you. Some people have the secret she knows that she likes to keep herself. You have some pictures of her, you told me. I'd like to see. Just you, I can not show them to anyone else. Would you want me to meet you somewhere? My place or motel or something like that. Where'd you say? Houston? Here's some photos. Number three, Margaret Ellen Fox. As the summer of 1974 was dawning, Margaret Ellen Fox was 14 years old. She lived in Burlington, New Jersey with her parents and her four brothers. For the summer, she and her cousin, Lynn, were looking for babysitting work so they placed an ad in the classified section of their local newspaper. Not long after the ad was published, Lynn received a call from a man who called himself John Marshall. John Marshall said he was looking for someone to babysit his five-year-old son at his home in Mount Holly, New Jersey, which is about seven miles from Burlington. He said he had a backyard which had a swimming pool in a swing set. Lynn's parents would not let her babysit in a different town, so she gave John Marshall Margaret's phone number. 
John Marshall then gave Margaret a call. He told Margaret he was looking for a babysitter to watch his son every weekday from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. He would pay her $40 a week and he would reimburse her for her bus fare. Then he, or his wife, would drop her off at home between 2 and 2.30. He wanted her to start on June 21st. Margaret happily accepted the job. But then on June 20th, the day before Margaret was supposed to start babysitting, the man called Margaret's home and talked to her father, David. The man who called himself John Marshall told David that there had been a death in his family and he needed Margaret to start on June 24th instead. John Marshall and Margaret arranged to meet at the bus stop at the intersection of Mill Street and High Street in Mount Holly. John Marshall said he would pick her up there and drive her to his home. He told her she would recognize him because he would be driving a red Volkswagen. On the morning of June 24, 1974, Margaret and her younger brother walked to a bus stop that was at the intersection of High Street and West Broad Street, which wasn't far from their home. Her brother saw her get on the bus at 8.40. That was the last confirmed sighting of Margaret by someone who knew her. A woman on the bus said she remembered talking to Margaret after her son pulled her hair. A male passenger thought he saw Margaret get off the bus at Mill Street and High Street, which is the stop where Margaret was supposed to meet John Marshall. He was also pretty sure he saw her talking to a man who had a red sports car. Other people also saw a girl that matched Margaret's description at the intersection. Margaret was supposed to call her parents once she got to John Marshall's house, but she didn't. They began to worry, but they figured she just got busy and forgot to call. John Marshall said that he or his wife would drop Margaret off at home between 2 and 2.30. But when that time came and went, Margaret's parents were flooded with dread. They called the number that John Marshall had given them, and they became even more alarmed. The number wasn't for a phone in a residence. Instead, it was a payphone outside of a grocery store in Lumberton, New Jersey, which is a town about two miles from Mount Holly. Margaret's parents called the police, and their neighbors helped them search Mount Holly. But 14 year old Margaret Ellen Fox was nowhere to be found. Four days after Margaret disappeared, her parents, Mary and David, received a ransom call. The police had their phone line tapped and they managed to record the call. In June 2019, the FBI released a segment of the call and they are hoping that someone will recognize the voice. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topping. Who is it? Because the clip is so short, we will play the recording again. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topping. Who is it? A day after the call, a letter arrived at the Fox's home. The letter said that the $10,000 should be placed in a box and then a blue ribbon should be tied around the box. The letter then went on to say that Margaret is all right. They had just ripped her blouse and broke her glasses. The note mentioned the left-wing terrorist organization, the Simonese Liberation Army, which is known by its acronym, the SLA. Four months before Margaret went missing, the SLA had kidnapped Patty Hearst, who is the granddaughter of publishing magnate William Randolph Hearst. The police and the FBI are not sure if the phone call or the letter were from the kidnapper. But two things in the letter stood out. The first is that none of Margaret's pictures show her wearing eyeglasses. 
Well, on the day Margaret went missing, she had her glasses with her. She also had her glasses cases with her, which had a picture of Huckleberry Hound on it. Also, the letter indicated that the box with the ransom money was supposed to be wrapped with a blue ribbon. When Margaret went missing, she was wearing a blue blouse. Fingerprints were lifted from the note, but no match to them were found. One interesting thing that the police noted was the phone number that John Marshall gave. It was for a payphone that was outside a grocery store. The manager of the grocery store was named John Marshall. The manager was interviewed and he provided an alibi for the morning that Margaret disappeared. He also took a polygraph exam and he passed. So he was ruled out as a suspect. Four years after Margaret disappeared, a promising suspect emerged. He was a sex offender who lived near the bus stop where Margaret was supposed to meet John Marshall. Besides his criminal record and the fact they lived close to where Margaret went missing, at the time Margaret disappeared, he drove a red car. But he had an airtight alibi for the morning Margaret vanished. So he was cleared as a suspect as well. Margaret's disappearance was incredibly hard on her family. Her father, David, said that the early mornings and the late nights were the toughest because that's when it's quiet and there was nothing else to occupy his mind. Sadly, both he and his wife Mary passed away without ever knowing what happened to Margaret. To this day, no trace of Mary Ellen Fox has ever been found. Most people assume that she was murdered. But a retired detective who looked into the case in 2017 isn't as convinced. He read Margaret's diary, which had several passages about her being bullied. The retired detective thinks it's possible that Margaret may have wanted to disappear so that she could start a new life. But he admits that it would have been difficult for a 14 year old to run away, settle down in a different area and stay away from her friends and family for 45 years. The FBI is currently offering a reward of $25,000 for information leading to an arrest and the disappearance of Margaret. They are really hoping that they will be able to identify the man who made the ransom call. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topic. Who is it? However, the FBI is not sure if the caller is the actual kidnapper, but they are hoping that someone will recognize his voice and contact them. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topic. Who is it? Even if he is not the kidnapper, they'll at least be able to eliminate that avenue of the investigation. The FBI is hoping that one day soon, they'll be able to give Margaret's surviving family some closure. Number 2. The Easy Street Murders Suzanne Armstrong and Susan Bartlett both grew up in the small city of Benalla, Victoria, Australia. They had been best friends since high school. In August 1974, the two best friends met up in Greece and they toured the islands. Both women were in their mid-twenties. While they were on their trip, Armstrong became romantically involved with a Greek fisherman. In early 1975, she discovered she was pregnant. She gave birth to a boy named Gregory in August 1975. Armstrong planned on marrying Gregory's father, but the couple couldn't make the relationship work. In December 1976, Armstrong moved to Melbourne, Australia, and she took Gregory with her. A few weeks later, Bartlett, Armstrong, and Gregory 
moved into a three-bedroom cottage on Easy Street in the Melbourne suburb of Collingwood. On January 10th, 1977, Marla went shopping with her mother and then her brother and his girlfriend came over for dinner. Armstrong and Bartley were having a problem with her stereo, so after dinner, Bartlett's brother fixed the stereo. Bartlett's brother and his girlfriend left the home at about 9 p.m. The next day, no one saw or heard from Bartlett and Armstrong. Neighbors heard Gregory crying, and they saw the dog outside. The neighbors thought it was odd that neither Bartlett nor Armstrong attended to the dog all day. They went and knocked on their door, but no one answered. So they left a note on the door and took the dog to their home. The neighbors were expecting that either Bartlett or Armstrong would come and pick up the dog, but neither did. Three nights and two days after Bartlett and Armstrong were last seen, two neighbors entered their home and they were shocked by what they found. Bartlett and Armstrong had been brutally stabbed to death. 27-year-old Susan Bartlett's body was found in the hallway near the front door and 28-year-old Susan Armstrong's body was found in her bedroom. Besides being dehydrated, 16-month-old Gregory was unharmed. The police are not exactly sure how the killer got into the home. There were no signs of a break-in or forced entry. It's believed that before they were attacked, Armstrong was reading in bed while Bartlett was somewhere in the back of the home. The police think it's possible that the killer knocked on the door and Armstrong let them in. Or they may not have locked their front door or windows and the killer simply let himself in. It's believed that Armstrong was attacked first in her bedroom. She had been sexually assaulted. Bartlett was attacked when she approached Armstrong's bedroom. She may have heard Armstrong being assaulted and she went to investigate. The killer spent some time in the house after the murders. Notably, he took time to pose Armstrong's body. He also walked through the house to the washroom that was at the back of the house. In the washroom, he showered to get the blood off himself. The murders were quite brutal. Armstrong had been stabbed 29 times and Bartlett had been stabbed 55 times. The murder weapon was not found at the crime scene. A large knife was found at a train platform a short distance from the crime scene on the night the women were killed. But no blood was found on the knife. The police later ruled out the knife as the murder weapon. Unfortunately, the murder weapon has never been found. It's believed that it was a large bread knife or something similar. On the kitchen table, the police found a piece of paper which had a phone number and the name Barry Woodward written on it. The police tracked down Barry Woodward. Woodward said that he and Bartlett had been dating for several weeks. He said that he went to the house on Easy Street on the evening of January 11th, which was the night after Bartlett and Armstrong were killed and two days before their bodies were found. Woodward said he had been trying to get a hold of Bartlett all day, but no one had answered the phone. So he and his brother went over to the house and they went inside through the back door. They went into the kitchen which was at the back of the house. Woodward said he wrote down his name and number on a piece of paper and then left it on the kitchen table. Woodward said that he and his brother left without looking around the rest of the house. 
Woodward said that he had no idea that Bartlett and Armstrong's bodies were in the front of the house. The piece of paper with Woodward's name and phone number was not the only thing found on the kitchen table. There were also articles cut from the newspaper, The Age. The articles were from the January 13 edition of The Age, which is three days after the murders and the day the bodies were found. If the police know who cut the articles out of the newspaper and left them on the kitchen table, they have never made that information public. In the days after the bodies were found, the police invited Tess Lawrence, a columnist with the Herald, to the murder scene. They wanted her to write a column that would hopefully stir up some leads or even provoke the conscience of the killer. When Lawrence toured the house, the walls were still stained with blood. In her column, which was published a few days later, Lawrence vividly describes the crime scene. Not long after the column was published, Lawrence received a phone call. As a newspaper columnist, Lawrence was no stranger to weird phone calls, but she said this call was different. She described it as spooky. The caller was a man and he wanted to talk to her about her column. He started going through the column and dissecting it. He told Lawrence that she wasn't as observant as she thought she was. He mentioned things that were in the house that Lawrence didn't describe in her column. He was particularly interested in the record player. He wanted to know why Lawrence didn't mention what record was on the turntable. While she was touring the crime scene, Lawrence took note of what record was on the turntable and other records that were out of their sleeves. But she deliberately left that information out of her column. What really startled Lawrence is that the caller knew exactly what record was on the turntable. The record seemed to hold a special significance to him. Lawrence wouldn't say what the record was, but she confirmed it was in the Beatles' White Album, which features the song Helter Skelter. Lawrence told the caller that they should meet up. The man did not give his name, but he said he was stationed at Victoria Barracks, which is just over three miles from the house on Easy Street. He said that he worked in signals. Then Lawrence thinks that someone came into the room where the man was calling from and he hung up quickly. After he hung up, Lawrence called the police immediately and told them to trace the call. But she is not sure if they ever did trace the call. The police have never talked about the call publicly. Lawrence asked the police if the records were dusted for prints. But once again, she did not get a response from the police. What she does know is that the man never called back. Since the caller knew specific details about the crime scene that were never made public, Lawrence thinks it is highly possible that the caller was the killer, or at the very least, knew the killer or he may have been calling on behalf of the killer. The police have had several suspects over the years. One of the most promising suspects was a crime reporter named John Grant. The house where Bartlett and Armstrong lived was attached to another house and the two houses shared a common wall. Two women lived in the house that was connected to Bartlett in Armstrong's home. On the night that Bartlett and Armstrong were killed, John Grant was sleeping on the couch in the adjoining house. Grant was not dating either woman who lived there, nor had he ever been to their home before. But on the night of the murders, he was drinking with the two women, and they suggested he crash on their couch instead of going home. Despite sharing a wall, the two women and Grant 
claimed that they didn't hear anything on the night Bartlett and Armstrong were killed. Since Grant was a police reporter, the police thought that he was well versed in police investigation tactics. They reasoned that if he committed the double murder, he would have known to leave as little forensic evidence behind as possible. But the police had much more damning reason to suspect Grant. It was the second crime involving a woman that Grant had been connected to in the past two years. Julie Garcia Lay moved from Stockton, California to Melbourne in late 1974. Her sister, Gail, had previously moved to Melbourne and she was feeling a bit lonely. So Julie moved there to keep her company and the sisters planned on moving back home around Christmas 1975. In Melbourne, Julie got a job at a publishing company as a library reference clerk. The publishing company printed a newspaper which John Grant wrote for. On July 1st, 1975, Grant came into the publishing company's library with two of his friends, a boxer named Reese Collins and a career criminal named John Joseph Power. Julie was working and she struck up a conversation with the three men. Julie, who was just a week shy of her 20th birthday, told the three men to come over to her apartment that evening. Julie lived with her sister, but her sister was out that night. The men agreed to come over and they arranged a time to meet. The next morning, Julie's sister Gail came home and noticed some odd things in the apartment. On the floor, there was a towel stained with blood. Also, Julie's underwear had been cut up and there were pieces strewn about the apartment. Gail also noticed that some things were missing from the apartment. This included $125 in cash, a black cape, and a carving knife. Gail called her sister's workplace and learned that she did not show up that day. So Gail reported her missing that afternoon. The police learned were at Julie's apartment on the night she went missing. They were all interviewed by the police and they all said that they were at her apartment. They said she left the apartment to make a phone call at a phone booth that was nearby. The three men said that she did not come back to the apartment, so they left. Beyond that, the police did not put much effort into investigating Julie's disappearance and the case went cold. Many people thought that the response from the police was odd because of the men who were at Julie's apartment that night. In July 1972, three years before Julie went missing, 49-year-old Rosa Rento, who lived in Melbourne, was killed when someone fired a shotgun from their car into her living room. John Joseph Power was arrested and charged with her murder. But in October 1973, he was acquitted of all charges. After Julie went missing, Power went to prison for several years for shootings and armed robberies. In 1992, Power was on parole and he sexually assaulted a 19-year-old woman. He was sent back to prison for the sexual assault. In total, Power served about 30 years in prison. During that time, he escaped twice. In 2002, Power was once again out on parole. One day, he had a sex worker come to his home and they got into an argument. Power held a knife to her throat. She managed to get away from him and she got help. Power was arrested. But after he was arrested, a court deemed that Power was mentally unfit for questioning. 
so he was not charged with assaulting the sex worker. Also, because of the court ruling, the police were unable to question him about Julie Garcia's disappearance. Power lived for another 10 years and he passed away in 2012. Reese Collins had a string of minor convictions, but nothing too serious. He died in 1998. If either man was involved in Julie Garcia's disappearance, they took that secret to the grave with them. Julie Garcia has never been found dead or alive. John Grant is alive and he has denied being responsible for the Easy Street murders and Julie's disappearance. In 2010, his DNA was compared to the DNA left at the Easy Street crime scene. It was not a match and he was cleared as a suspect. Several people have accused the police of botching the Easy Street murders investigation. For example, several neighbors said that they saw a man around the house on the night of the murders. But the police never followed up on these sightings. One neighbor said she saw a man washing something in Bartlett and Armstrong's kitchen sink. The neighbor contacted the police, but they never interviewed her to get a description of the man. The neighbor died about 10 years after the murders. Whatever she knew about the killer died with her. Another problem with the investigation is that several members of the victim's immediate families, like Suzanne Armstrong's sister, were never interviewed by the police. The police have said they are still actively investigating the Easy Street murders. Also, in April 2018, they officially labeled Julie Garcia's case a homicide. But unfortunately, they have not found any answers in either case. Since the police have the Easy Street Killer's DNA, it may just be a matter of time before he is identified. If he is identified, he'll close the case by one of Australia's most notorious unsolved mysteries. There is currently a $1 million reward for information leading to an arrest in the murder of Susan Bartlett and Suzanne Armstrong. The police are also hoping that someone with information regarding the whereabouts of Julie Garcia Lay's remains will come forward. Number 1. Barbara Miller and Ricky Wolf. On December 14, 1980, there was a break-in at the office of a telephone company in Herdon, Pennsylvania. $30,000 was stolen from the office. Just over a month after the robbery, a man named Mark Bowling was arrested. He confessed to taking part in the robbery. Then he made a shocking accusation. He said that not long after the robbery, a police officer named Joseph Egan, who went by the nickname Mike, had approached him. Egan was an officer with the Sunbury, Pennsylvania Police Department, which is a short distance from Herdon. Bowling said that Egan told him that he knew he was involved in the robbery. Bowling said that Egan wouldn't arrest him if he gave Egan a cut of the money. Bowling decided to take the deal. So on February 13, 1981, Bowling handed Egan $5,820. The police looked into Bowling's accusation and they found evidence to prove that he was telling the truth. Egan was arrested and charged with extortion. He went to trial in November 1981 and it ended with a hung jury. He went to trial again in January 1982 and he was found guilty. 
he was sentenced to two and a half years to seven years in prison. While Egan was in prison, he somehow met Sunbury resident Barbara Miller. When he was released from prison in 1988, they started dating. But by the spring of 1989, they had broken up. On June 30th, 1989, Barbara attended the wedding of a friend in Mifflinburg, Pennsylvania. There was a reception at a local bar and Barbara planned on attending. But first, she went home to Sunbury to change her clothes. She did not end up coming to the reception. Barbara lived with her 14-year-old son, Eddie Miller. On the morning after Barbara attended the wedding, Eddie came downstairs and noticed some disarray. A photograph was missing from the wall, while other pictures were askew. Also, the couch had been moved slightly. Eddie remembered that the night before the wedding, his mother and Egan had gotten into a fight. Egan was angry because she was going to attend the wedding without him. On July 5th, five days after the wedding, Barbara's estranged boyfriend, Mike Egan, reported her missing. Egan told the police that he saw Barbara on the night she went missing after she had returned from the wedding. He said that she took off with two guys to go to a motorcycle rally. At first, the police didn't treat Barbara's disappearance too seriously. They thought that she would return home at any time. They did not think that foul play was involved in her disappearance. Her family thought that the reaction from the police was odd. In the year leading up to her disappearance, Barbara had filed seven reports with the police because she had been stalked and harassed. Some of the reports indicated that Egan and his friends had been stalking and harassing her. Barbara had also received several threatening letters, supposedly from a motorcycle gang. The letters were written on the motorcycle gang's stationery. The authors of the letters wrote that they were aware that Barbara knew about illegal activity committed by other people. The authors warned her not to go to the police. The authors also instructed Barbara to make a friend of the gang, an unidentified man, happy and she should stay with him. People who saw the letters thought that they were odd. The letters clearly threatened Barbara to keep quiet about criminal activity that she knew about. This is illegal. So why would a motorcycle gang send her these letters printed on their own stationery? A few days before Barbara went missing, she withdrew all her complaints from the police and got the letters back. Barbara told the police she wanted to withdraw her complaints because she and Egan had patched things up. According to one report, when Barbara went to the police station to withdraw her complaints, Egan was with her. It was not until a year after Barbara went missing that the police first announced that she may have been a victim of foul play. But they could not find any evidence as to what happened to Barbara, so it wasn't long before the case went cold. Some people think that Barbara's disappearance is connected to a murder that happened two and a half years before Barbara vanished. On December 12, 1986, 31-year-old Ricky Wolf's dead body was found on a boat ramp north of Montondon, Pennsylvania. Wolf's hands have been handcuffed behind his back. The cause of death was blood force trauma to the head. The medical examiner determined that he had been beaten to death with a pair of nunchucks which were found near the body. 
Two and a half years later, in May 1989, about a month before Barbara disappeared, the police arrested 22-year-old Robert Hummel. Hummel had been a drug dealer and he had been feuding with 23-year-old Scott Schaefer. Around the time that Wolf was murdered, Schaefer, Hummel, and a third man, William Hendricks, were selling drugs together. But after about a year of working together, Hummel tried to have Schaefer and Hendricks killed. His attempt was unsuccessful, and Schaefer told his associates in the drug business not to deal with Hummel. This essentially put Hummel out of the drug business, and he was bitter about it. In May 1989, Hummel decided to exact some revenge. He went looking for Schaefer, but he couldn't find him. He could only find Schaefer's two brothers. Hummel and his friends confronted Schaefer's brothers. Schaefer's brothers managed to get into their car and they took off. Hummel and his friends gave chase. The brothers drove to the police station and Hummel was arrested. Hummel then started talking about the murder of Ricky Wolf. Hummel claimed that he and four other men killed Wolf. He said that the other four men were Mark Byers, Thomas Yoder, William Hendricks, and Scott Schaefer. Byers, Yoder, Hendricks, and Schaefer were arrested a short time later. All four men denied being involved in the murder. Schaefer was very vocal about his innocence. He claimed he had never met Wolf and had no idea who he was. Schaefer took eight polygraph exams and he passed them all. Despite their pleas of innocence and no physical evidence connecting them to the murder, all four men were charged. In June 1980, a few days before the men's preliminary trial, Scott Schaefer's girlfriend received a mysterious phone call. She did not answer the phone and the caller left a message on her answering machine. The caller said that if the charges against Schaefer and Hendricks were not dropped at their preliminary hearing, then Barbara Miller would come forward with evidence that would exonerate them. The charges against Schaefer and Hendricks were not dismissed at their preliminary hearing and they were ordered to face trial for murder. The recording of the voicemail was handed over to the police. About two weeks after the call was placed and a week after the preliminary trial, Barbara Miller went missing. Starting in early 1990, about five months after Barbara disappeared, Four of the five men went to trial separately. The only man who didn't go to trial was Robert Hummel. He made a plea deal which allowed him to plead guilty to third degree murder and he was sentenced to 10 to 20 years of prison. He got the plea deal because the district attorney had no physical evidence that connected the other four men to the murder. The district attorney's case relied entirely on Hummel's testimony. Mark Byers and Thomas Yoder were acquitted. William Hendricks was found guilty of second degree murder and Scott Schaefer was found guilty of first degree murder. What was damning at Schaefer's trial was the murder weapon. Wolf had been killed with a pair of nunchucks which is an incredibly odd murder weapon. At the time of the murder, Schaefer was studying martial arts. So the district attorney argued that Schaefer would have had access to nunchucks and he would have known how to use them effectively. Both Schaefer and Hendricks were sentenced to life in prison. Hummel ended up serving 12 years of prison. In April 2002, not long after he was paroled, he recanted his confession. He said he did not know if Schaefer and Hendricks killed Wolf 
because he wasn't involved in the murder of Wolf. Hummel swore that he was not on the boat ramp when Wolf was killed. The police then began to investigate the possible link between Wolf's murder and Barbara's disappearance. They learned that the recording of the voicemail that was left on Schaefer's girlfriend's answering machine, indicating that Barbara knew something about Wolf's murder, had been lost. Unfortunately, that was the only recording. Once again, the investigation into Barbara's disappearance led nowhere. In 2004, two years after Humble recanted his confession, which was the only evidence against Hendricks and Schaefer, their convictions were vacated. They both proclaimed to be innocent, but they pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of third-degree murder, and they were sentenced to 10 to 20 years of prison. Their sentences included time served. They both sat in prison for another two years, and then they were paroled in 2006. Scott Schaefer has been trying to clear his name ever since. Schaefer has said that he thinks Hummel was involved in Wolf's murder, and he committed the murder with another group of men. Shaver said that Hummel simply said it was he and Hendricks who were with him instead of his real accomplices. In 2009, the police received a tip that Barbara's remains might be in the home where the sister of Mike Egan used to live. But the investigating detective felt that he didn't have enough evidence to get a search warrant for the home, so he didn't search the house. Once again, Barbara Miller's case went cold. Then in 2016, the Sunbury Police Department got a new police chief, Tim Miller, who has no relation to Barbara. Tim found the tip that Barbara's remains may be in the home where Egan's sister used to live. Supposedly, a lot of drug-related activity happened in the home. Tim was able to get a search warrant for the home. When the home was originally constructed, there was a dirt floor in the basement. But when Tim and his team went into the basement, they discovered that someone had laid a concrete floor. Also, some of the concrete walls in the basement appeared to have work done on them. Tim had chunks of concrete removed from the basement one odd thing that was found mixed into the cement was wood chips. It led Tim to speculate that wood chipper was somehow used in the disposal of Barbara's body. Since being released from prison, Egan worked as a tree trimmer. After removing slabs of concrete from the basement, Tim got a search warrant for the home where Barbara used to live. On the underside of one of the steps, some hairs were found that looked like Barbara's hairs. The day after, Barbara's former home was searched, a pond in Sunbury was searched, and a metal barrel was pulled from the water. All the evidence was then sent for forensic testing. After Tim Miller reopened the investigation into Barbara Miller's disappearance, he told the press that he thought that Scott Schaefer and William Hendricks were innocent in the murder of Ricky Wolf. He also said that he thought that Barbara's disappearance was connected to Wolf's murder. He thinks that she possibly knew something or had evidence that pointed to the real killers. A search warrant that was issued indicated that Barbara's estranged boyfriend and former police officer Mike Egan is the prime suspect in Barbara's disappearance. Tim thinks that Barbara was attacked and killed in her own home. She was most likely attacked at the base of her stairs. Then her body was possibly disposed of in a wood chipper. Then the remains were mixed into the cement that was used to update the basement in Egan's sister's home but Tim Miller never saw an arrest in the case 
while he was chief of police. In July 2018, he resigned as chief of police. He planned on becoming a barber instead. In January 2018, the Sunbury Police confirmed that female bone fragments were found in the cement taken from Egan's sister's basement, but they have not confirmed if it is Barbara Miller's bone fragments. Mike Egan continues to deny having anything to do with Barbara's disappearance. In early 2019, Scott Schaefer asked for the evidence from Ricky Wolf's murder, like the nunchucks, to be tested for DNA. He is sure that the test will prove that he and William Hendricks are innocent. Ricky Wolf's son believes that both Schaefer and Hendricks are innocent and he supports having the evidence tested for DNA. The state strongly opposes reopening the case. In August 2019, a state prosecutor asked a judge to deny Schaefer's request to have the evidence examined for DNA. A decision has yet to be made in the case. Unfortunately, while the police have a theory about what happened in Barbara's disappearance, there are still a lot of questions. Are the bone fragments Barbara's remains? Did Mike Egan kill Barbara? If he didn't kill her, then who did? Was Barbara killed because of what she knew about Ricky Wolf's murder? If so, what did she know? Or what evidence did she have? Also, if Scott Schaefer and William Hendricks didn't kill Ricky Wolf, then who did? When Wolf was killed, Egan was still in prison, so he was not physically involved in the murder. But is Egan connected in another way? If Egan wasn't connected to the murder, why would he want to kill Barbara to protect Wolf's killers? Was he ordered to kill Barbara? If so, who ordered the hit? Or is Barbara's disappearance less complicated than it seems? Was she killed because of a lover's spat? Their disappearance is not at all connected to Wolf's murder. After all, shortly before Barbara disappeared, she and Egan had been broken up, and Barbara's son Eddie remembers them fighting the night before she went missing. Once again, it's important to note that Mike Egan has denied all involvement in Barbara's disappearance, and he has never been charged in connection with her disappearance. Many people would like to know the answers to these questions and they are hoping that with forensic evidence, the answers to some of these questions will be coming soon. Number 3. Colleen Paris Plantation is a small city in South Florida. It's about 30 miles north of Miami. It was home to the Paris family. Nick and Nancy Paris only had one child, Colleen. They adopted her when she was just a few weeks old. In September 2000, Colleen Paris was 18 years old. Although she was a good student, she had dropped out of school earlier that year. But she ended up going to summer school and she was going to graduate in October of that year. Colleen liked bowling, playing darts and billiards. She was also artistic. She sang, she played the piano, and she wanted to be a professional actor. That September, she was working as a restaurant hostess. In December, Colleen was planning to go to Colorado for a vacation with her family. Sometime in 2001, she was going on a cruise. Colleen was dating a man, and their relationship was going well. On the night of September 30th, 2000, Colleen was planning on going to the Florida Marlins baseball game with her family. At 3 p.m., she got a phone call on her cell phone. After getting the call, she said she was going out for a few hours, and she would be home between 5.30 and 6 o'clock so she could go to the baseball game. 
but sadly, she didn't return home. Her parents ended up reporting her missing. Six days after Colleen went missing, her friend found her car, a white two-door 1994 Mazda MX-6, parked in the parking lot of an abandoned Wendy's in Terramac, which is a city about seven miles from Plantation. There were no signs of a struggle in or outside the car. The car also contained no clues as to her whereabouts. Missing from the car was Colleen's purse and her cell phone. Neither have ever been found. It's suspected that Colleen's disappearance is linked to the phone call she got just before she left the house. In the early 2000s, getting call logs for cell phones was a difficult task that often took weeks or even months. This was true even if there was a subpoena involved. By the time the phone company got the request, the records of Colleen's incoming calls were gone and there was no way to trace the call. Nick and Nancy are sure that Colleen did not choose to disappear. She simply had too much to look forward to, including graduating and the upcoming vacations. Also, she had saved $1,000 and it was left untouched. If she were to run away, she probably would have taken the money with her. There has been one person of interest in the case, and that is Colleen's uncle. Apparently, Colleen was using LSD and ecstasy, and supposedly, she got the drugs from her uncle. Hours after Colleen went missing, Colleen's best friend called her phone and accessed her voicemail. There were three messages from her uncle. He reminded Colleen that they were supposed to meet that afternoon at a shopping mall. Colleen's best friend deleted the messages because she didn't know that Colleen was missing. She didn't like Colleen's uncle and didn't want Colleen to hear the messages. The police were unable to retrieve the deleted voicemails. Colleen's uncle was uncooperative with the police and he also refused to take a polygraph exam. He was the only friend or family member of Colleen who didn't take a polygraph exam. In early 2004, America's Most Wanted produced a segment about Colleen's disappearance. The uncle was interviewed. He denied having anything to do with his niece's disappearance. He also said that he didn't call her on the day she disappeared. He also denied that he was providing her with drugs. One tip that came in was that Colleen was considering performing in a porno to make some fast money. Apparently, this was her uncle's suggestion. The uncle was asked if he advised her to do the porno film, and he denied this as well. However, the uncle did tell the police that he offered to set up Colleen with work as a lingerie model. So while suspicion lingered around Colleen's uncle, he is considered a person of interest, but he has never been publicly named as a suspect. He has never been charged in connection with Colleen's disappearance. Colleen's parents had her legally declared dead in 2007. Nick and Nancy believe that finding out who called her is the key to solving the mystery as to what happened to her. They believe that the call lured her out of the house and ultimately to her death. They hope that anyone with knowledge about who may have called her or what the call was about will contact the police. Colleen's parents still hope that she is alive, but her father says he is horrified by the thought that for years she may be alive somewhere and held against her will. On the screen now is an age progress photo of what Colleen Paris may have looked like in 2018 when she was 36. If Colleen is still alive today, she will be 39 years old. Number 2. Helen Sebastian In early 1983, 51-year-old Helen Sebastian lived alone in a flat in Racine, Wisconsin. Her mother lived on the floor below her. 
Helen was an alcoholic and she was known to frequent bars on 6th Street and Racine. Otherwise, she lived a quiet life. She was a widow and she did not have any children. On February 20th, 1983, Helen was planning on having a few friends over for dinner. That afternoon, she put a large roast in the oven. She prepared dinner for her 87-year-old mother and dropped it off. She told her mother that she was going to a friend's home to play cards. Helen's main mode of transportation was walking, so she left her house on foot. A short time later, two friends saw her just over half a mile away from her home. Then, she disappeared. That night, when she didn't return home, her family got into her apartment and found the burnt roast. Helen owned two parakeets, and she didn't leave food out for them. The next day, Helen still had not come home. She was diabetic, and she was supposed to pick up pills that day, but she didn't. Helen's family reported her missing 48 hours after she visited her mother. Her family and the police were baffled by her disappearance. No one thought that the 51-year-old widow had any enemies. But shortly before she went missing, Helen's sister, Jean, received a mysterious phone call in the middle of the night. The caller, who was a woman, asked Jean if she was Helen's sister. Jean said she was. The caller said that Helen didn't have long to live. The call really unsettled Jean. For weeks, no one knew what happened to 51-year-old Helen Sebastian. Then, on March 28th, the wife of a police officer heard a story that a 10-year-old boy had found a set of human limbs in the yard of a vacant house. The boy had only told his friends about the limbs and not his parents. The police went and talked to the boy. The boy told the police they first saw the limbs 10 days earlier. He then took them to the vacant yard. In the backyard was a set of arms and legs that were cut off at the knees. Animals had eaten the fingers, so the police weren't able to get fingerprints. The limbs were found just over a mile away from Helen's home and about half a mile away from where she was last seen. The next day, near some railroad tracks just over half a mile away from where the limbs were found, some internal organs were found in a paper bag. The day after that, a human head was found wrapped in paper and plastic bags about a block away from the organs. All the body parts belonged to Helen Sebastian. Her torso was never found. The medical examiner was not able to determine how Helen died. The police had several suspects in the case. One was a man who used to live in the flat where Helen was living. He had threatened her before he moved out. He was cleared as a suspect. Helen was known to hang out in taverns on 6th Street and Racine. In January 1983, about a month and a half before Helen went missing, there were several break-ins at taverns on 6th Street. Joanna Levanis was a 74-year-old widow who owned a jewelry store on 6th Street. She lived alone in the back of the store. On January 12, 1983, she was found dead in her bed. She had been stabbed three times. The murder weapon was found buried in her chest. She had also been beaten and strangled. A few trays of rings had been stolen. Several months later, on April 9, 1983, the police arrested 24-year-old William Mattis for the murder. The police received a tip from someone who said that Mattis had admitted he killed Levanis. In custody, Mattis confessed to killing Levanis. He said that he had been drinking on 6th Street and he went to borrow money from her. He considered her a friend and he had borrowed money from her before. 
This time, Levanus said no, and he became angry. He beat, strangled, and then stabbed her. In June 1983, William Mattis was convicted of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life without parole. Helen's family believes that Helen was friends with Joanna Levanus. Helen's family has always wondered if Helen knew something about the murder or the break-ins at the taverns that she shouldn't have known and she was killed to ensure that she stayed quiet. The police have investigated this angle, but found no connections to Helen. Helen's case was cold until the summer of 1990, about seven and a half years after the murder. Then a person, who chose to remain anonymous, called the police and suggested a suspect. Based on that call, the police developed a prime suspect, but he was never arrested. The police could not find any evidence to charge him with anything. The man has never been identified. So again, the case went cold. The police in Racine said that periodically, an officer goes over the case. In 2008, a detective who worked on the case said that he believes that the case is solvable. He said that a major problem is talking to Helen's friends whom she hung out with at the bar. Many of them lived hard lives and as a result, their memories aren't very clear or reliable. Nevertheless, the police and Helen Sebastian's family are still hoping that someone with information will come forward so that after 38 years, her brutal murder will finally be solved. Number 1. Catherine Hawks On the afternoon of September 20th, 1977, a power outage left nearly the entire province of Quebec, Canada without power. As a result, the commuter trains in Montreal were not running. 33-year-old Catherine Hawks worked in downtown Montreal. She lived in Cartierville, which is a neighborhood in the north end of Montreal. Since she couldn't take a train, she took several buses. She got off at a bus stop that was a short distance from her home. Shortly after Hawks got off the bus, the following call came in at 911. <laughs> A short time later, the same man called 911. However, for unknown reasons, the police never went to the area to investigate. About 24 hours later, two men called the police. They were walking in a vacant lot near the bus stop where Hawks got off the bus and they noticed an awful smell. They looked around for the source of the smell and they found the dead body of 33-year-old Catherine Hawks. An autopsy was performed. Hawks had been raped and beaten. But the medical examiner could not determine the exact cause of death. She could have died from the beating she received or from exposure because it was unseasonably cold that night. After the body was found, the police were heavily criticized for not going to the lot after receiving the two phone calls. Catherine Hawks' family believes that if they did go to the lot, she wouldn't have died. The police didn't develop any suspects and the case soon went cold. Nearly 39 years later, in May 2016, a popular news program in Quebec 
had a lawyer and a filmmaker on as guests. They were working on a documentary about a possible serial killer who may have preyed on women in the Montreal area in the 1970s. On the show, they played a recording of the two calls. Just over a week later, the lawyer's office received a letter from an anonymous person. The writer said that they recognized the voice. The author gave the man's name, his date of birth, where he went to school, and what he did for work. The letter was then given to the police. They did not make too many details from the letter public. They did say that the man named in the letter was born in 1946 in France and he was a computer scientist. They also said he might be dead. The police have not been able to confirm if the man did make the call. They didn't even confirm if he was alive or dead. The police are hoping that someone with knowledge about Catherine Hawk's murder will come forward. If the killer is identified, Hawk's murder may not be the only murder that is solved. As we mentioned, a lawyer and a filmmaker were doing a documentary on a possible serial killer who may have been killing women in the Montreal area in the 1970s. Two very similar murders happened around the same time that Catherine Hawks was killed. Ten days before Hawks was murdered, Helene Monas went to a restaurant in Chamblay, which is a city about 20 miles east of Montreal. It was her 18th birthday. After hanging out with a friend, she started walking home alone. The next day, her semi-nude body was found in a park in Chamblay. She had been severely beaten and strangled to death. It's believed that she was also sexually assaulted. Then, a month after Hawks was killed, on October 23, 1977, 23-year-old Denise Bazinet was out drinking with friends in Montreal's East End. The next day, her partially clad body was found beside a highway near Chamblay. She had been strangled and possibly sexually assaulted. She was last seen walking with a man and based on the witness's description, this sketch was developed. Like the murder of Catherine Hawks, no one has been arrested for the murders of Helene Manas and Denise Bazinet. Some investigators believe that the serial killer may have murdered at least 10 women. We discussed the possibility of a serial killer preying on women in the Montreal area in the video Three Creepy Unsolved University Mysteries Part 2. We'll have a link to that video at the end of this video. Sadly, whether the three women were murdered by the same person or not, their cases are considered cold. The police are still hoping to identify the person who made the calls to 911. Number 3. Stephen Chait In the spring of 1972, 20-year-old Stephen Chait was enrolled at Columbia University in New York City. He lived on campus in Fernald Hall. He worked part-time at Delicatessen. Stephen was the eldest of Harry and Gloria Chait's three children. He was always considered bright. His mother said he was reading the New York Times and U.S. News & World Report by the time he was nine years old. He was also a great athlete who excelled at track. 
he was on Columbia's relay team. Initially, Stephen was enrolled in engineering, but then he got a C in a key course and he was devastated. He had never gotten a C before, so he decided to change his major to art history. Even after changing majors, he was depressed by his perceived failure because he was a perfectionist. His mother said that he tended to feel like the world had failed him or that he had failed it. On March 13, 1972, Stephen spent most of the morning listening to music on his bed. He preferred classical music. He got up and put on his jacket and his knit hat. He told his roommate to take it slow and then walked out of their dorm room. 20-year-old Stephen Chait was never seen again. His friends waited two days before they contacted Stephen's parents. Gloria and Harry reported him missing to the police. The police thought that he would return voluntarily, so no searches were conducted for him. Unfortunately, the police were wrong and Stephen's family never saw him again. But his mother may have heard from him. Starting on Mother's Day 1972, about two months after he went missing, she started receiving odd phone calls. The caller wouldn't say anything. She would get these calls two or three times a year. Gloria thought that the caller was Stephen. She would say his name and tell him she loved him. She also begged for him to come home. The caller wouldn't say anything. The caller would stay on the line for several minutes before hanging up. These calls continued for 25 years and then suddenly, in 1997, they stopped. Gloria kept a log of them, but she never found out who made the calls. Stephen's disappearance was hard on his family. Gloria was depressed and would cry often. Harry developed a drinking problem. Stephen's brother also suffered from depression. His sister found the sadness of the home unbearable, so she stayed away as much as possible. Gloria and Harry also lost all their friends because people felt uncomfortable around them. But eventually, things got better for the family. Gloria joined a support group for families of missing people and made new friends. Harry eventually quit drinking. Tragically, Harry died of a brain hemorrhage in 2002. In 2005, 33 years after Stephen went missing, Gloria decided to pack up Stephen's clothes and give them to charity. In 2012, New York City's medical examiner's office started exhuming bodies from paupers' graves on Hart Island. They were hoping to solve some missing persons cases using new technology like DNA. But Stephen's body was not among the bodies that were exhumed. Gloria knew her son was depressed when he went missing, but she doesn't believe he died by suicide. Instead, she thinks he walked away from this life and started a new one. She hoped to find out what happened to her son during her lifetime, but sadly, she didn't. Gloria Chait died in June 2020 at the age of 91. If Stephen Chait is still alive, he would be 71 years old at the time of this recording. Number 2. Sherry Ellen Rowland In the winter of 1982, 20-year-old Sherry Ellen Rowland, who lived in Fort Worth, Texas, was enrolled in modeling school. One problem was that Rowland was 5'4", so she was too short to be a runway model or a high fashion model. However, people at the school still thought she could do specialty modeling and specialty photography. Roland worked at a 7-Eleven convenience store to make ends meet between modeling jobs. She started working there at the end of summer 1982. 
20-year-old Sherry Rowland went to work on the night of November 27th to work the overnight shift alone. Shortly after arriving there, she started receiving obscene phone calls. The calls disturbed Roland so much that she called her boyfriend. He told her to call the police, so she did. The police agreed to do checks on her throughout the night. An officer went to the store at 1.30 a.m. and he spoke with Roland. The calls had spooked her, but she didn't seem too worried. The officer came back at 2.20 a.m. He stayed in the car and Roland waved at him. At 3.52 a.m., he returned to the store for the third time. This time, he didn't see Roland. He entered the store and saw a trail of blood leading to the back room. He followed the trail of blood. In the back of the store was the dead body of 20-year-old Sherry Roland. She had been shot in the right arm and the chest with a shotgun. Near the register were two spent 20 gauge shotgun shells. Her pants had also been pulled down. The medical examiner determined that she had been raped. The police checked the register. It appeared that Roland checked the register at 3 a.m. Then the killer pressed the no sale button to open the register. There was blood on the no sale key. It's believed that the killer stole about $20, which is about $60 in 2022. The police said that the phone calls may be connected to the murder, but they refused to tell reporters what the caller said. They said they wouldn't be able to print most of it because it was pretty rough, pretty bad. The police had a long list of suspects. Many of them were suspects in other armed robberies in the area. However, they were all eliminated as suspects. In May 1983, five months after the murder, the police arrested a 20-year-old drifter named Leslie Dwayne Spawn. The police said he had made a statement that incriminated him. But the charges were later dropped because the police learned that Spawn was in jail on the night of the murder. After that, the case went cold, and it's been that way ever since. The police said that the case is open, and they are still investigating. They have not said for sure if the calls are connected to the murder. However, why are the odds that Roland received obscene and disturbing phone calls on the same night she was raped and murdered? It has been nearly 40 years since 20-year-old Sherry Ellen Roland was murdered. Her surviving family members still hold out hope that her case will be solved. Number 1. Eve Strafford and Lynn Whedon Eve Strafford was born in 1953 in Dortmund, West Germany. Her father was an English medic who was stationed in West Germany after World War II. While she was young, the Strafford family moved to England and settled in Hampshire. In 1973, Strafford started working at the Playboy Club in London. She had the position of promotion bunny, so she was one of the top earners at the club. In 1974, a scout from Playboy magazine traveled from the United States to see if Strafford could be one of the playmates of the month. The scout thought that Strafford needed to lose a few pounds before she could pose for the magazine. After that, Strafford took a two-month leave of absence from the club and began visiting modeling agencies. She signed with an agent and got two modeling jobs. One was to appear on the cover of a South African crime novel. In the photo, a man is holding a knife to her throat. The second was Mayfair, a British adult magazine geared towards men. It's very similar to Playboy. Strafford posed nude for the magazine, and she was Girl of the Month in March 1975. She used the name Eva Von Bach. Along with the photos was an interview with Strafford. The interview included the statement, If a man is truly a man and not effeminate in any way, 
He'll know how to handle me. I like to be dominated, not whipped and tied up or things like that, but just kept in my place. I get very bored with straight sex. I like playing little games with my lovers to turn us both on. Unfortunately, the Mayfair spread got Stratford in trouble at work. Posing for a Playboy rival was against the rules of the Playboy Club, so she was suspended from working there for three months. On March 18th, 1975, a few days after the magazine was published, Stratford met with her agent and then met with a publisher. She then purchased some dry flowers at a shopping center. She took the train home and arrived at her station at 3.45 p.m. She then walked three quarters of a mile to her flat that she shared with her boyfriend, Tony Preeze, and two of his bandmates. Preeze was the lead singer of the psychedelic rock band, Onyx. The band had some success, but things weren't going well then, so Preeze had a day job as a forklift operator. As Stratford walked home, it started raining. It's believed Stratford arrived home at about 4.10 p.m. When she got home, she stripped off her wet clothes in her bedroom. At 4.30, the downstairs neighbor heard Stratford talking to a man. 45 minutes later, the neighbor heard a loud thump like a chair had fallen over. Then she heard footsteps going down the stairs. Shortly after that, the telephone in Stratford's flat started ringing, but no one answered it. At 5.25, about 10 minutes after hearing someone leave the flat, Stratford's boyfriend, Tony Preeze, and another one of the tenants arrived home. In the bedroom, they found a gruesome scene. 20-year-old Eve Stratford had been brutally murdered. Her body was on the floor beside the bed. Her throat had been cut from ear to ear eight to twelve times. She had been nearly decapitated. She was wearing a bra and underwear and negligee. The negligee was open in the front. The belt from the negligee, along with one of her stockings, were used to bound her wrists behind her back. Her other stocking was tied around one of her ankles. The medical examiner determined that Stratford had sex that afternoon, but it's unknown if it was consensual or rape. The police thought that the sex was consensual and that she was killed afterward. They thought this because there were no signs of a break-in or first entry. Plus, she was wearing her underwear, a bra, and the negligee. The police surmised if she had been raped, she probably would have been wearing less clothing. The police eliminated Tony Priest as a suspect because he had an airtight alibi. Another suspect was the photographer who took the photo of the crime novel. The police thought it was too much of a coincidence that he'd photograph her with a knife being held against her throat and that her throat was slit. But he was ruled out as a suspect as well. The police learned that Stratford started receiving mysterious phone calls shortly after the Mayfair issue was published. Sometimes the caller wouldn't say anything and then hang up. Other times he would threaten her or say obscene things. On the day she was killed, she received three of these phone calls. Another bunny who worked at the Playboy Club, Marilyn Looms, said that after she posed for Mayfair three months before Stratford, she received similar phone calls. The caller would threaten her or hang up. The police initially believed that Stratford knew her killer and the Mayfair issue set him off for some reason. They noted that the phone call started after the issue was published. But what was odd was that Mayfair didn't publish her real name. Plus, her phone number and address were unlisted. But the killer knew where she lived. After Stratford got home, she took out her clothes because they were wet. There were no signs of a break-in or first entry. This suggests that Stratford knew her killer and felt comfortable letting him into the apartment while she was only wearing her underwear and possibly a negligee. 
She may have even had consensual sex with him before she was murdered. But the police eliminated all the men in Stratford's life. Then, the case went cold. Nearly four years later, there was another murder that was very similar to Eve Stratford's murder. On January 19, 1979, mother of two, 29-year-old Linda Farrow, returned to the home that she shared with her boyfriend. Her home was five miles away from Stratford's home. Farrow and her husband had split up a year earlier. Farrow was four months pregnant with her new boyfriend's child. That afternoon, Farrow went out shopping. When her two daughters, who were 11 and 8, returned home from school, they found her dead body in the hallway. Her throat had been slid nearly to the point of decapitation. There were no signs of a break-in or first entry. The police thought that Farrow knew her killer. Or he was waiting for her to get home, and then he slipped into the home after she walked in the door. There were several similarities between the cases. Both victims were attractive women with blonde hair in their 20s. Both victims worked at night spots in London's West End. Their throats had both been slashed. They were killed in their homes with no signs of a break-in or first entry. Unfortunately, no arrests were made in Farrow's case. It also provided no new suspects in Eve Stratford's murder. So both murders went cold. Decades went by. Then in 2007, over 32 years after Eve Stratford's murder, there was an unexpected break in her case. DNA from her murder had been linked to another murder. However, it wasn't Linda Farrow's murder. Instead, it was the murder of 16-year-old Lynn Beeden. Six months after Stratford's murder, on September 3rd, 1975, Whedon was there with friends. She started walking home alone. She walked down an alleyway she had been told not to use alone at night. But the alleyway was a shortcut to her home, so that night, she took it. As she walked, a man snuck up behind her and hit her on the head with a blunt object, possibly a lead pipe. This blow fractured her skull. The attacker picked her up and placed her on the other side of the fence where there was a power substation. He then dragged her to an isolated area. He raped her and left her there unconscious. The next morning, Whedon was found and she was taken to the hospital. She never regained consciousness and died a week after the attack. For many reasons, the two murders were not connected. One reason is that the two women were attacked on the opposite sides of London. Strafford was cut with a knife in her home and Whedon was attacked with a blunt object while walking home and then raped in a public area. Strafford was an outgoing Playboy bunny who had recently posed nude for a magazine and Whedon was a reserved schoolgirl. Strafford was stalked and harassed before she was killed and she possibly knew her killer. Whedon, on the other hand, was a victim of opportunity. Had DNA not connected their murders, investigators may have never surmised the same person committed them. After the connection was made, the police reopened Eve Stratford's case. They took DNA samples from 16 of the most promising suspects, but no match was found. The police also decided to reopen the murder of Linda Farrow. From the evidence, they got a sample of the killer's DNA. The DNA did not match the DNA of the man who killed Stratford and Whedon. In January 2009, on BBC's Crime Watch, a detective said that a suspect in Farrow's murder was her ex-husband. They believe he either killed her or hired someone to kill her. He was apparently unhappy that she left him, moved in with another man, was pregnant with his baby. But by the time DNA profiles were generated, 
he had died. There is some speculation that Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon were killed by a serial killer who murdered other women. However, the police have not publicly addressed other cases that they might suspect are connected. They have only confirmed that the same man killed Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon. The police hope that the killer told someone about the murders and they'll come forward. Another possibility is that forensic genealogy may be able to help solve the crime. So it may just be a matter of time before one of Britain's most notorious pair of murders is finally solved.